we always took it as our as our responsibility to meet the needs of the people who decided to play our games the way they were written yeah rather than the needs of the people who decided not to play our games as they were written and so right. we always that the the people who would who would follow the rules were were always our first audience and so writing the rules to be followed came from that when you discuss what has been happening and trends in role-playing games over the last 5, 10, 15 years. One thing that demands to be part of that discussion is Apocalypse World. McGay and Vincent Baker put together a role-playing game that for many changed how games were played. From Apocalypse World, we get Monster Hearts, Dungeon World, Monster of the Week, and so many other games. In many ways, we can find the DNA of Apocalypse World in many games that aren't even labeled Powered by the Apocalypse. I sat down with McGay and Vincent Baker, and we talk about where the idea came from. When did they think playbooks would be a thing? Where'd the concept of moves come from? We discuss their influences. We discuss what they have influenced. And overall, we just have a really pleasant conversation over two hours. I will tell you, we had some audio challenges, so the audio quality of this interview is not as great as I like. Boy, oh boy, it's worth enduring. McGay and Vincent were incredibly generous. They held nothing back. So I'd like you to sit back, relax, and enjoy my time with the Bakers. Third Floor Wars delivers interviews, insights, and discussions about everything hitting the tabletop. Rule books, plastic models, dice, and cards in hand. Let the gaming begin. Tabletop games let you escape and unleash grand battles and regale epic tales of adventure with your friends. If you love gaming and learning from players, designers, experts, and creators, you are in the right place. Pull up a chair. Craig and Ray welcome you to the third floor and the Tabletop Talk Podcast. Craig here on the third floor. Today we have two trailblazers of the role-playing industry, McGay and Vincent Baker. They themselves changed the entire landscape of role-playing when they published the famous Apocalypse World back in 2010. Now, McGay and Vincent, uh, welcome to the third floor. Thank you. Thank it's you great to be here. Us. Yay! We made it all the way! <laughs> <laughs> Two flights of steps! Yay! <laughs> so I guess, um, and it's this is interesting, so this is my first time interviewing a couple. Um, I've had two guests, but not two guests that have spent a majority of their life together. Yeah. And, you know, so normally at this point in the, you know, very beginning, I want to find out how did you find out about gaming and things like that. Um, but I guess, what did you find first, each other or gaming? Uh I started playing D&D &D in 1978 when I was seven years old. No so kidding. That was the start. And um, I met... Long before me. Yeah. And, um, and then I moved across country, and it took me a year to find new game folks. I was... So, seventh grade. And then it took me a, another move across country, and um, that's where we met in college. Yes. So let's focus on you finding D D at seven years old. How does that happen? Um, my neighbor, Jenny, her older brother was given the red box basic set as a um, birthday present or something. And he was, let's see, Jenny was 10. So Aaron would have been 14. And it just didn't click with him. And Jenny was like, this is a thing that we will now play for the next <laughs> ever. And so for my, my first gaming group was Jenny was 10, her younger brother Jono was nine, I was seven, my sister was five, and we played practically every day until I moved to California when I was 13. No kidding. Yeah. So, I mean, it's not like just picking up Monopoly, right? It's, it, it's a whole new way of gaming, it's, and there's really nothing to learn from. How did you guys like wade through and kind of figure it out, or did you just kind of do what you did? Um, I actually think that it's a lot like what we do anyway as kids. You know, we're already steeped in storytelling and playing pretend and make believe and have it. And if, if you want to just 
lay a little bit of extra rules on top of it, it's not actually that big a leap. And we all were already well steeped in a lot of the source material, um, all the all the whole fairy tale genre, all of right. uh, Tolkien, all of the um, Lloyd Alexander books, all of that sort of thing, Madeline Langle books, all the th- sort of stuff that we had either those of us who could read were reading or had read to us by our parents. Um, so we were, you know, we were psyched. We were ready. And <laughs> it was, it was not a problem. And then Star Wars came out, of course. And we were like, oh my right. God, we can do this in Star Wars. <laughs> <laughs> and so, so Jenny made a whole, her whole own thing of like just porting it over when she was like 12 or something. So by the time. Unbelievable. Was, yeah. So that was, that was a thing. And then. I played a lot of Macross, Robotech Macross, and um, yeah. things like that in high school and D and D in high school, and then yeah. So for me, that's one of the foundational pieces of my game design is that that sort of play is our not even necessarily our human, but our primate, perhaps our mammalian birthright. That sort yep. of play and find out, and Vincent's like. Oh, why not reptiles? Um, <laughs> I'm, like, I'm like, you should ask the crows. What they yeah, do. right. So um, I think that there is an understanding, especially as we come to adulthood and we want more, um, more uh, affordances and constraints, more structure, more intensity of like, how do I do this thing on it? And our lives get more complex too. So it makes yeah. sense. Um, but if we could do more remembering that, we we got this. We know how to do this. We know absolutely how to say, okay, so you're a wizard and, and I'm a wizard and that's a dragon and let's oh no, you know. We know we know how to do that. Yeah, no, it's very, very true. I actually, um, I had two uh, uh, experts on adult play on the show um, a little while back, and it was fascinating to hear them say very similar to what you said, which is It's not playing that's unnatural. If you go even to the animal kingdom and look at how the animal kingdom learns, you know, very important skills, it's all through play. And it was very, very fascinating uh, to hear that. So I'd be curious then, McGay, when you, so you had your play group, right? Until you're like 13 years old and then you move and you start playing with a new group, right? You start, how different. How different was the experience in the game? Did it change a lot or? <laughs> okay. So I moved from rural upstate New York. Like really? Where in upstate New, New York? York. Um, do you know where Oneana is? I do. I do. I'm do from where... outside of Syracuse. Okay. So do you know where like Norwich and Morris are? I've never been, but I know where they are. Okay. So um, Oneana is, Morris is to Oneana as my hometown is to Morris. Okay. And there are around 400 people in town and there have been for the last hundred years, whatever you can draw the whole thing on a napkin. Um, and I moved from there to San Diego. Um, Oh, wow. Yeah. In the, in 80, in the middle of the eighties, um, to go to middle school, which was culture shock. Like you would not believe. Can't even imagine. So it wasn't necessarily the gaming. Like it took me a little while to find a gaming group, but it wasn't, you know, there was so much else around it. It was culture shock. And then you had, like, shortly after that, the very beginnings of Vampire the Masquerade and other things that created massive ripples through. And by that time, there was Shadowrun and there was Cyberpunk and there was Talislanta and there was all this other stuff going on. So it wasn't just D&D. And then right. um, the girl who was my primary uh, DM for the Macross camp- campaign was a senior in high school when I was a freshman. And... Then after she graduated, that group continued on playing stuff. Very cool. All right. So now we're going to move over to Vincent. So Vincent, did you, were you before seven or did she beat you out? (laughs) She beat me out by like a year. Okay. (laughs) My, my uncle, when I was around eight, um, got into Zork on, on the computer. Wow. And I'm uh, old enough to know Zork. (laughs) We, uh, um, uh, my youngest uncles are about the same age as me. My mom's youngest brothers. And um, we used to, when we couldn't use the computer, we used to pretend Zork and I would be the computer. And uh, 
So, so this is me at eight and nine. Um, I, I made my uncle write out his commands, and then I would write the answer and give it back to him. <laughs> that, that That's amazing. An hour or something before. He was like, would you just listen to me? <laughs> Shut up. We don't talk. <laughs> I'm a computer. <laughs> That's really funny. Yeah. <laughs> I never played Dungeons and Dragons. Maybe once in high school, like one session Yeah. in high school. But I never played really? Dungeons and Dragons until uh, 2008, I want to no, say. No, Chris Carroll. Wow. We were in a oh, oh, that's right. We, we did play Dungeons and Dragons together in college. That's in, right. In 1990. <coughs> So did so if Dungeons and Dragons, I mean that's supposed to be everybody's first role playing game. What was your first formal role playing game then? Like that had rules that wasn't two two people writing pieces of paper about pretending to be computers. It's pretty cool and like it is really cool. How close is that to Wizards Grimoire? Really? <laughs> well, don't don't ask that. Huh? Okay, that's <laughs> nothing. <laughs> Spoiler. Can you tell us later? Um. Could have been no, no. I played uh, or chill. The the first real character I ever made was for Twilight Two Thousand. <laughs> nice. Which would have been eighty eight uh, or eighty nine, but we didn't play that. Um, my friends were fighting about Twilight Two Thousand, and we made characters and then didn't play. Um, we played a <laughs> that, that, ta- that tale has been told many a time. <laughs> yeah, right. That's that's like the classic thing. Our 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 youngest. Just it, there's experiences that they have as a 15 year old that you know are so different because they just have this experience of growing up where you play games and it just goes as opposed to yeah. all as the three of us who like most of the time you make a character and that's it and you're like yep. yeah this is gonna be cool Blah. yeah anyway. yeah I, I, I think the first real game oh go ahead. Well, and it's also there's also a generational piece to that too, which is something that I've really have been learning a lot as I've been doing a lot of these interviews, is that our generation is kind of the first generation to hand over. Yeah. You know, officially, because the generation before us may have come up with role playing, but there was like five of them, right? <laughs> we were kind of the first generation that that adopted role playing at, at, a, at a bigger group. And um, you know, one of the things that I often talk about is like I ask the question, um, you know, wh- why is role playing bigger now than it's ever been before? Like, what the hell happened? And one of the theories that I keep hearing is, is well, th- th- it's been handed down. Yeah. And yeah. And we, we multiplied, we multiplied and we run Apple and Microsoft. (laughs) I think think that there's a couple other factors. And one of them is that it it had to take long enough for a a full rotation from um, the the people above us were like, had a whole different way of doing things really. And then we grew up with so much of the media about like, Dungeons and Dragons was the worst thing. Mm -hmm. Like, I, in the 80s, in Southern California, in the middle of the satanic panic, it was a a real time. And then everything else around that, and then, like, the the stereotypes of, like, how geeky and nerdy and awful and whatever. And it's taken us, culturally, a long time to get through that and come back around to, oh, you know what? Storytelling is cool, actually. Um, And... Then there's the internet. That's the yep. other major thing. I was talking with uh, one of our designer friends in Korea recently about, because the uh, tabletop role-playing game scene in Korea is considerably younger than in the U.S. Interesting. And it basically, in the format that we, we would recognize it, like I, I, will, I will stand here and bang my fist on the table that they have a indigenous culture of playing games and figuring things out as, as humans. But a lot of it got imported with the internet. Right. And so that was a similar conversation. Like what happened? How did I'm like the internet arrived, yeah, no. right? And yep. when it was Jenny and Jono and Serena and I, we were the only four kids in our whole town in, and in our school that we knew of, which was probably false. 
There were probably right. other kids around, but we didn't know them. We had no way to connect them. Exactly. We couldn't afford the books necessarily. There's a whole yep. barriers in many, many ways. And then the internet arrives and suddenly everybody can find each other, even if it's just like alt.games.rec. whatever it was on BBSs yeah, in the, the old, 90s. Yeah, the old BBSs, yeah. No, it's, that's very, very true. And and the ability to acquire knowledge, yeah. right? Because I mean, I remember and I would imagine you two having to hunt down like game books and yeah. you know figure out and you know and you would find somebody else to play and you were like well how do you play and yeah. so, you know now it's just like type 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 and i can watch 50 people play the game you yeah. know so it's yeah. amazing yeah. so um so D D wasn't your first introduction vincent so um what do you consider kind of like your first like big what was the first big role-playing game for you um the first the first one i was thinking about it the first one we played many times in a row was shadow run in yeah 88 89 yeah and um but I picked up a big stack of Dragon Magazine back issues at a uh, tag sale when I was 16 or something. And that was that was all I knew of D&D. That was my, well, no, I mean, we had the cartoon and we had the satanic panic. And yeah. my friend Jeff's older brother played D&D. Like, it yeah. wasn't all I knew. But that was my exposure to the, the guts of Dungeons and Dragons. Um, Those magazines were great. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, rem- I remember going to Walden Books and buying right? Dragon Magazine. Walden <laughs> Books! I remember going to Walden Books and, like, they, you know, it was definitely, there, there was not that sort of money for me as a kid, absolutely. But, it, you know, you could go to Walden Books and look. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And that was cool. That so. was very cool. I remember buying, uh, see, I bought my Red Box at a Walden Books, and I think I bought GURPS at Walden Books. Um, and those were my biggies growing up were, yeah. were, you know, the Red Box and GURPS. So you guys are now in college. And is that when Vincent meets McGay? Oh, or? Yeah, yeah, oh. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I was a year ahead of Vincent in school, and um, I met him on his first day there. Yep. Yeah. Oh, no kidding. Yeah. And where was this? At Hampshire. Hampshire College oh, okay. in um, Amherst, Massachusetts. Yep. Excellent. Yep. Excellent. Um, and not this is not a love story podcast, but was it uh, you guys figured it out pretty quick or it took a little while? Yes. Or? No, it was like it was 45 minutes. maybe. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not <laughs> even kidding. Awesome. It was it was it was like, oh, but and this was September 9th of 1990. And then Esther, our dear, dear friend, Esther Clinton, lived down the hall from Vincent and the three of us were practically inseparable for two months, like a month and a half. Yeah, something like that. Like, wow. So I'm, I'm there and I'm all excited about meeting incoming students and showing them how to get their dining hall pass and where the laundry is and how the buses work and things like that. And, you know, I met Vincent and that was amazing. And Esther's room across the hall or down the hall was already like entirely set, calm, beautiful, hand-drawn, picture of the the white tree and i'm like we're just gonna be friends and um anyway so we spent a, a six weeks or so both of us telling her how cool we thought the other one was and she finally sat us down in my room and said look i i am here if i'm in college and I have papers to write so sort this <laughs> Figure this right. out. <laughs> That's yeah. amazing. Now, was there a common love of gaming? Was that part of the conversation that drew you to each oh, other? Yeah. I mean, oh, yeah. um, I don't. I mean, I think we would have overcome that. But um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was definitely part of the scene. Yeah, Absolutely. yeah. were we already playing games together? Yeah. It must have been. Yeah, yeah, was yeah. it Ars Magica? Um, or was that Chris's? Um, we played. We played Cyberpunk first. And Cyberpunk. Then we oh played God, first. We played D anD D, and then we played Cyberpunk, Cyberpunk. and then we played Ars Magica. That's we seven. played Cyberpunk for six yeah, months yeah, or yeah, something, yeah. and then Ars Magica for years and years and years and years and decades. We had a decade-long game, the two of us and Emily Kerboss, which I wow. still think of fondly. Yeah, it's amazing how uh, how RPG burns just memories into you and and moments and sessions that you can remember. Um, mm-hmm. It's something that I've always said is very unique about it. So I'd be curious for the two of you: has role playing games always been the prominent form of gaming for you or did you do a lot of board gaming card games things like that or was it always just pretty much rpgs in terms of like together or before or life in general or sure (laughs) my family played a ton of games masses we we always played games um always 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 and then 
uh, so my parents' health declined. Um, my little brother started designing more and more games custom for their needs. needs. Yeah. Um, Interesting. Well, okay, so it started with my dad. He decided he didn't care about winning and losing, so he would play with his cards all showing all the time anyway. And that really frustrated my little brother, who really liked rules so and trying to win and stuff. Say, so he would design games that could accommodate that. <laughs> cool. Um, we could say... Hiram Baker. Hiram Baker. Who is a really excellent card game designer. And like a, a couple of his games are out there. You need to go find them. They're wonderful. Yeah. He, um, uh, yeah. 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 He's a really sharp designer, but he, he spent, he has spent so much energy really custom designing games for your mom. Yeah. Isn't that something? Um, my mom had dementia. Um, and so he was designing games in track with her with her progression through the disease that she could still play and that would help her that were you know would were um, mental and emotional practice for her. that's incredible, that's incredible. Uh, yeah. yeah it's in a, it's really amazing yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and it gets to our point about the importance of play and, and how obviously important that was uh, f- for her and for him uh, to feel like he could provide right and and yeah, and offer yeah. some comfort and uh some escape as well that's amazing um yeah. so when did the two of you either together or separately first start dabbling with i'm gonna let's make some changes to this or let's let's try something new or like when did that when did you be, when star transition? wars came out in <laughs> <laughs> i mean for me it was zork <laughs> yeah, true true yeah um, you I, know, when I when I say, if I may, when I say that I didn't play a game until Shadowrun in 88 or 89, that's because I was running my own games uh, through middle school and, and early high school. Um, and, you know, they weren't good, but, <laughs> right. but it started with it started with design for me. Well, uh, let's backtrack one second, because one of the things that's interesting about Hiram's work with your mom is that your mom was a game designer her entire life in raising oh, yeah. your kids. No, that's Because Via homeschooled most of Vincent's siblings at various stages and made probably thousands of customized teaching games of all kinds to meet each child where they were and, you know, give them yep. support yep. in that way, in a way that was engaging and fun, most with Hiram, because games were his uh, one of his main ways of learning things and so yeah. really nice parallel so um the the piece where you're designing things all the time as a kid and you're like oh they weren't good but they were also you got to do that part first oh yeah you know? yeah so so what what do you think drove that for you then vincent like what what made you say okay i know there's rules already out there but i want to do this on my own my own way and run my own games as early as high school like that i mean what do you think was the driver on that well, I mean, since you asked, part of it was poverty. Yeah. Um, yeah. I yeah. didn't. I didn't buy a game book until I had birthday money when I was seventeen or something. Um, uh, you know, I found I found a stack of Dragon magazines for fifty cents, and and that was what I could work with. Yeah, and like similarly, I I never. I don't think I ever had my own even my own D and D books until. I, I am quite sure that I was in college. Um, they were always like Jenny and John, the Jenny's older siblings or our GMs in, you know, my two different GMs that I had in um, high school. And then in, in college, there was like the club that had its own library, which was good. And then other people had their game books. But I think <sighs> I'm trying to think of, it was probably as an Ars Magica book, which was the first thing I bought. Wow. That I remember buying. Could be. Um, yeah. I know I never bought any of the, the like Vampire the Masquerade and all of those. Those all belong to my friends. Mm. Yeah. So the transition was a little bit different then. And, and let's start with you, Vincent. So you go from you know, out of necessity, creating your own games, piecing them together from from these magazines and relics and, you know, things in your head to sitting down and playing Shadowrun. And Shadowrun has a book and it has rules. And was that, were you like, yeah, no, we're going to change this. Or did you, was it nice to play a game that was already designed? Um, 
Well, the the transition that happened at the same time is that I was a player instead of the GM. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, and so sitting down to play Shadowrun with my friends was was in a lot of ways really different um, than running um, my own game for different friends. Um, we moved at, at that time, too. Mm-hmm. Um, but then when it was my turn to, to run a game in that group and we ran Talislanta, I said, okay, we're going to play Talislanta, and here's the sheet full of differences that we're going to play with, you know. Um, I, I like this magic system that I made up better, and everybody's like, oh, actually, that is better. And I'm like, yeah, <laughs> I know, I, I made it better on purpose, you know. Um, but, so, uh, I am not positive I ever ran a game straight until the Forge. Even when we when I ran Cyberpunk, I I swiped a bunch from Shadowrun. Yeah, uh, yeah. No, no, I I ran straight Shadowrun. My friends insisted on that. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> but but the desire it sounds like the, for both of you the desire was always there, right? To 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 make it your own, to to make some changes, to see. You, what you obviously thought were improvements because you went with it um, as opposed to just straight out of the box. Is that fair? I, I wouldn't necessarily. Desire is an interesting word because for me, um, there was always more of a, a why would you not? You're making up everything, everything else. I didn't ever, I never felt as though I was not allowed to. Right. Ever. right. You know, it was never of like, oh, I wish I could. It was like, well, how about this? You know, and if I was, were if there was a GM, I always felt comfortable, and I'm extremely fortunate in that. I always felt comfortable saying, well, "What about this? Hmm. Do you, this this would be kind of cool." Always felt comfortable, and like there was the time in high school we were playing D and D, and we were all goofing off like mad, and as any group will, and. Um, John was just, our DM was just like fed up with us. And so somebody said, fine, I grab it. And, you know, there was a, this big staff in the middle of the room. I'm like, cool, I'm just going to grab it. He's like, okay, the ceiling starts falling. And like, oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> but, I don't like consequences. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, so I think the desire to, to design was there. But also it's the, it's the, the idea that you could. Um, and I think that that is a, one of the things that comes out of our background, our you know, things that we both the, share, is the, the commonality. Yeah, yeah. Of, yeah. Of you figure it out, you know, what can you do? Um, and it's so easy to, 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 to miss that. Um, and we were both lucky to have through all of whatever we had. Somehow we got the, the, the gift also of, well, what can you do? What What do you want to do? And sit around and tell stories. That's free. Yeah. Um, and and then it is a thing of like wanting something a little bit more. It's like like the magic system that you brought in. You know that you were just saying. Like oh, I like this a little better. And for me, it was um, the game with uh, the Ars Magica game with Emily when we were thinking of like what about this doesn't quite do what we want to do. How about, how do we, how about these yeah. other, how about this other dice system, which is the other kind of dice, which shows up in, um, Siren. Um, that was kind of the first concentrated, let's work together to make something different that we're going to, that can, that we're going to implement and use in a reliable way, as opposed to so much of the earlier stuff that I did in terms of, you know, it was more spontaneous. Like, what if it happened like this instead? So, so I'd be curious, was, is this a, I'm trying to think of the way to phrase this. If I mess this up, yell at me, the, this desire to tinker or, or, the, or, the, or not feeling the need to get permission to tinker. Like it, it was instinctual and, and just obvious for you, the two of you. Does that happen outside of gaming too? Do you, you know, want, want to fix cars or is there another part of your life where you see the same pattern? Yeah. Yes. Yes, for me. I mean, Tell me. I would. Okay, so cars in specific, right? I I like cars. Um, I grew up around cars and trains and big, like big engines and stuff. But um, 
the, the, the moment of intersection is when we needed to patch the uh, a hole in the uh, body of the car in order for it to pass inspection. And I was like, well, I have never done body work on a car, but there, I, I guess I have to. It's that thing I was like, yeah. we have to. We can't right. afford to do it. I'll figure it out. Yeah. What else are we gonna do? And then Gideon told me, I'll like, just go get like some Bondo and some fiberglass cloth. And I'm like, it has the word cloth. Therefore, I am able to do it. Um, and it's like the thing we say to our kids over and over. Like the instructions are on the box. The world wants you to know how to do things. Yeah. So why not? And I think something that has really grown with time is that it's like the say yes or roll dice sort of thing. You know, if someone says, can you help me fix this antique thing? Yes. Mm-hmm. And if I can't, I will be honest and know where the limits of my ability are. Yep. If, if you don't know, Meg is a textile historian and a preservationist. Conservationist. Conservationist. Yeah. There we go. So, um, like, that's that's what she does. Right. Um, I work... I which has a lot of overlap, I would imagine. Yeah, yeah. I like to say I meddle in, I meddle in the affairs of the dead for the benefit of the living. Um, which <laughs> is true. Um, but yeah, the thing about like store, how we tell stories, why yeah, we yeah. tell stories, where they connect to other aspects of our lives. Um, what makes an, I, what makes some, an event meaningful, um, is very, very much interwoven yeah. with. As well as who history. gets to tell stories and what stories oh, they get to tell. Oh, very interesting. Yeah. That's a whole, that's a whole thing. <laughs> yeah. It's a whole thing. Whole thing. One of the things that's really interesting for me personally is being part of, um, I work with small local history museums in Western Massachusetts, um, a whole bunch of them. Uh, and uh, one of the things that's really interesting to me about that work is helping little museums deal with NAGPRA issues, the laws, regar- laws regarding uh, Native and Indigenous ah. artifacts. Right. Um, and there's laws around that. And a lot of little organizations have no idea how to interface with that, are terrified of the whole prospect, stymied entirely. And I'm like, just... It's on the box. They want you to know how to do this. <laughs> they wrote it so, down. They wrote it down. <laughs> That's funny. So, it, but it, that ties in directly to the thing of like, who tells the story? Yep, what yep. is the story? There's always more to the story. And I feel like the same is true with role playing. You know, there's always new ways you can look at that and angle. So. Yeah. The Insider Insight series allows me to talk to developers, designers, artists, writers, and industry insiders about the creative process and how they approach their work. Um, and today what we're going to do is kind of walk through this process with uh, both McGay and Vincent and try to learn how, you know, we've stopped here for a second, right? We see the beginnings of it. Let's go to the next steps. When we get back from this break, I want to talk to them about some of their earliest published materials. We'll be right back. If you're an athlete, you know the greatest motivator of all is the fear of letting your teammates down. After all, a team is only as good as its weakest link. So you owe it to those wearing the same jersey as you to be your best every time you step on the field. That's why there's no vape in team. When you vape, you can expose your lungs to toxic chemicals that can damage your lungs. If you're a step behind, the team's a step behind. Brought to you by The Real Cost and the FDA. Howdy friends, Craig here. You deserve a new play mat. Here on the third floor, we use mats by Mars. They are scratch resistant, waterproof, wet erase marker compatible, almost free of glare and lighter than neoprene. Mats by Mars gives you over 40 designs to choose from. You pick a mat, pick a design, and then you pick an overlay, like one for Marvel Crisis Protocol, Star Wars Legion, or even Malifaux 3rd Edition. Those overlays will really speed up your deployment and make the placement of objective markers so easy. Use our promotion code in the show notes to get a 10% discount on your first order. In the notes of your order, you can even request the third floor logo on your mat for free. That makes the best mat in the business even a little better. So get some new mats, save yourself some money, and help support the show. Go to matsbymars.com. All the details are in the show notes, including the discount code. So 
so now that we understand, you know, the type of people that the bakers are, um, let's talk a little bit about what you consider kind of your your earliest creations. Um, not necessarily your change in the Ars Magica the magic system, right, which was consumed by four people, but stuff that you actually put out there um, that people started to consume. What 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 do you what do the two of you consider kind of your first works that were significant for you? Yeah, yeah. Um, my first was in 2001, and it was called Kill Puppies for Satan. <laughs> I've heard was, of it. Uh, you've heard of it? Yeah. Um, it was, uh, I forgot to ask, do we, do we swear on this podcast? Yeah, yeah it's fine. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. okay. So um, that was my fuck you to gaming. I was never going to design a game um, after Kill Puppies for Satan. And uh, <laughs> that was your big moment, right? <laughs> yeah, that, that was it. So I never did. No, um, <laughs> so it was a great episode, guys. I appreciate you coming. Back. <laughs> I, I, uh, the new Ars Magica came out. It was Ars Magica third edition, which was the White Wolf Ars Magica, right? And oh, we were just out of no, this no, was, can I tell been the out story? Of for 10 I years. have to tell the story. Wait, no, I'm, I'm going to tell part of the other okay. part of the story. Um, All right. Uh, the, uh, I knew I would hate it. The, the new Ars Magica, um, knew I would hate it. Uh, I had been lurking on the email list that had been developing it. And I, I, I mean, who, am, who am I, right? Like I disagreed with the direction they were going, but I'm, I'm just a mm-hmm. fan at that point, right? Like I don't have any grounds to disagree. All I can do is not buy their book. So, um, <laughs> I knew it was going to cost 60 bucks. So that was the, the annual budget for the, for role playing games that yeah. year. Um, and I said, well, I'm going to make kill puppies for Satan and see how far 60 bucks takes me. And I printed it at work and I bound it at the copy shop and I abandoned it on, I literally abandoned a couple of copies on the doorstep of um, the game store in town. Never to be heard. Oh yeah. No, of again. course. Um, but I I mailed a copy to Jonathan Tweed, a couple other designers, as a love letter because I was a big Ars Magic fan. He had designed Ars Magic, um, and I said, "Take this as fan mail." And I I mailed him a copy, and he wrote me back. Wow! Um, and that was that was a big moment in my <laughs> in turning it away from a fuck you to game design forever into a, a thing I might actually do. Um, so what did he say when he wrote back? What was the reply? He said that uh, when he opened it, he didn't expect every sentence to actually be a sentence and every paragraph to actually be a paragraph. That's what he said. <laughs> <laughs> it was yeah, yeah. <laughs> he said, this is hilarious this is actually and written. really well written. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting, interesting. So now he I said, have to I'm not sure about the game design, and I said, "Well, it's not meant to be played. It's called Kill Puppies for Satan." What the hell? John now, Tweed. when you say it was the fu fu to gaming, um, like what what exactly did you mean? Like, I'm just going to put out this game that's really not a game, or or was it the uh, anti game? No, or was, had, had Hole come out? Buttery wholesomeness and Human oh, Occupied I don't, one. I, don't I, know. I think Human Occupied Landfill came out before. I have no. no. That's a title, isn't it? Do you not know it? No. Oh my goodness! Oh, look that one up. It's Definitely one. do find it. That was that was an early. Well, I'll I'll, I'll, I'll I do not remember. I'll Google it. it. We can but, find so, out. So we um, have the power. No, it was it was my fuck you to to being a game designer. It was my um, I had signed up to play test a game, you know, and and received the play test materials for this game that it was like a mid tier company that is no longer with us. Oh wow! Yeah. I knew. Hole was a hundred years before Kill Puppies for Satan. It came, <laughs> came out in ninety five. Kill yeah. Puppies for Satan wasn't until two thousand one. But um, and this this game, you were modern day monster hunters in in the year two thousand, and it was horrible. It was systemically terrible, and it was morally bankrupt. Interesting. Um, the, the line that that got me was. Um, even though trolls are sentient, they're an endangered species, so you can't kill them with impunity. And I was like, "What?" I yeah. was like, it, it's, it's, "It's time for me to write Kill Puppies for Satan." Yeah. If we're if we're if the field is inviting this kind of, so I was I was pissed off. At, yeah, um, yeah. 
and I knew that Ars Magica was going to be terrible, and it, it really seemed like the field of... Oh, and this is before Google, this is before yep, yep. PayPal, this is before PDFs. Lulu, this is before PDFs. The only route was was to be published. There was no self-publishing True, or large, right, very yeah. limited self-publishing. Um, certainly, I didn't have access to anything beyond printing it at work and mm-hmm. taking it to the copy shop to be to be stapled or whatever. Yeah. Um, and so it really seemed like like I had wanted to design games professionally for a decade or something at that point. And, Since I um, met you when you were 19. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> 18, um, 18. But so, um, so it really seemed impossible. It really seemed like, like I would not be able to do what I wanted to do in role-playing game design. Um, and was that, I mean, did you, was the message like, I'm just gonna throw my hands up. This industry is not for me, even though I know I'd be like, yeah. I, I'm trying yeah. to get a sense of what the message was. But there's, hey. there's another piece. Oh. There is an important another piece with, with pup with the, with Kill puppies for Satan that ties into this feeling you had, which was that we had just had a new baby. That our oldest was three and a half, and our new baby was new. Yeah. Um. And so, without any of the tools that we now enjoy of the internet and PDFs and PayPal and you know Patreon and Kickstarter and Lulu and you know, in uh, Indie Press Revolution and uh, any one of a billion things. Yep. Like, I think part of it was that you're like, I'm, f- fuck you. You know, I have two little kids. Right. And I have a, I have to, yeah. And also I have 60 bucks. How far can right. I take 60 bucks? Yes. Yeah. Right. Um, no, there was definitely a, not, not a, you know, fuck you, I'm gone and fuck you, here I am. Fuck you. <laughs> 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 but it sounds like you were, would it be fair to say you felt deterred by the structural? Oh, yeah. Uh, lot, yeah. Lot, yeah. That makes yeah. sense. That's, that's a very, Absolutely. very good and succinct way of putting it. I think. Yeah. So, so what happens next then? So then I, uh, this new, this new Google thing happens. Magic. And I type into Google free RPGs because I figured I couldn't be the only one. And I wound up, this would have been 2001, 2002. 2002 yeah. I wound up at The Forge, which was a, just a web forum um, uh, of people who were making independent role-playing games in the, the very beginnings of that. Um, yep. And I said, hi, I have some cranky ideas, which I did and still do, and... I think I think there's a lot of nonsense that gets called rules in these games. Mm-hmm. Um, Can you give me an idea what what that means, Vincent? Like, what, yeah, give yeah, me yeah. an example of what you think is nonsense, or what at that time what you thought was nonsense. So, um, and this, like, uh, me and Meg and our friend Emily, Emily Care Boss, um, who published the Romance Trilogy, you might know uh, her some of her games. Um, the um, we had been playing Ars Magica co-GMing for a while. So good. And so good. Thank you, Ars Magica, for bringing troop-style play as a thing we could talk about. Yeah. Um, we'd been on Rec Games FRP Advocacy. Yeah. For years uh, by that point. Yeah. Since 96. Um, Since 94. Which was, a, which was a very early RPG theory um, news group, in this case. And then... When that had moved over, we had moved away from that or whatever, we weren't doing that. We continued um, talking about RPG theory pretty intensely. So one of the one of the things that I disagreed strongly with with the nuance magica, let me see if I can say this, is to to me and to us, if I say as the GM, there's a rustle in the bushes, it's orcs. What has to happen at the table among the human beings who are there playing the game? What has to happen for it to be true that there's a rustle in the bushes and it's orcs? Um, And the going wisdom at the time was, well, you said it, you're the GM, so it's true. But the exercise is, Meg say, 
wait, Warwick's out here, and now I have to rethink that. Mm-hmm. Oh. So, so my position is was and is that what has to happen for it to be true is that the group has to come to uh, to a consensus, to an agreement, to um, everyone has to what's that form of the verb assent that it's true mm-hmm. um mm-hmm. and so the the power of truth is not in the the speaker but in the listener and um and like one of the things that was really true about that time playing that game with emily is that you know we had two little kids and so you and emily were talking very deeply about game design theory a lot and I was not as much. I mean, <laughs> I was, <laughs> but you know, it's. I, I was. I think. I think it's important to recognize Emily's in, impact on yeah, our yeah. game design at that point. At, at that because, point, because uh, you know, she'd come over and she'd play with our oldest kid, and um, she'd hang out and talk game theory, and you know, it just was very, very much. I think. I think to Emily. And the, like the people on the forge too, but Emily was someone who would hang out with us at our house, um, helped create a bridge to what could come after. Oh like yeah. If, if we hadn't had any local people and like other people, Tony and et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Um, if we hadn't had any local people, but it was, you know, like, I don't want to say if we hadn't ha- had, because Emily is, um, amazing in her own right yeah but her mind is so so sharp yeah yeah um, she's an amazing uh role-playing thinker amazing the sum up is that the going wisdom at the time was that the gm spoke with authority if the gm said it was true it was true right and i had seen so many times right well first of all when we hadn't had a gm but also so many times when somebody says to the gm wait really works out here right and the the gm goes oh no no you're right you know this that in fact the GM doesn't ever get to unilaterally assert anything. It's always negotiated, and so that was that was not the going wisdom at the. Time. Well, I was about to say that must have like you must have turned some heads with those ideas. Well, that was my that plan. was kind of the plan, and like we were. <laughs> we I were... certainly yelled a lot. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, it's the offstage games, off, off offstage great games. That's later. I know it's later, but I, it very much connects to the stuff that we were doing. You know, like oh wait, this is true. Yeah, yeah. but so, um, but so that's what the forge was like. Um, uh, Kill puppies for Satan was sort of notorious. Um, and then I followed it up with a, uh, a game that I never completed all the way called other kind that, um, was very influential, uh, at the forge. And then other kind is where you get the dice pool that then is assigned to like, like in my game, Siren, where you have different, different pieces of the outcome that you draw from a pool, but then, so it, it, it's, that that's what that became. Right. You roll your pool of dice, and after you've seen the numbers, you assign them to the parts of the outcome. Like, I'll put a six in accomplishing my goal, and I'll put a three in not getting hurt, and I'll put a one in right. nobody else get hurt, gets hurt. Yeah. Um, and so... And that's something that you, you know, we designed for other kind, and then we played, we used that with Emily yeah. in yeah. our Ars Magic game. That came out of that Ars Magic game. Yeah. Yes. Um, and that was a very influential game. I, yeah, I would imagine. <laughs> so the recognition, Vincent, that it's um, it's a collective effort to design the world, right? Which which is contrary to c- wisdom at that t- easily at that time, and, and for many, it still is. Um, the idea that that we as a table are going to we're going to tell this tale together, and it's not I'm not putting on a performance as the GM, and you know you're doing more than just being a character um, in my world. Right. So mm-hmm. we're throwing that away. I wonder early on, did you enforce that through this is how games should be played? Or did were you finding yourself creating mechanics to enforce this concept? Yeah, the way we used to do it is we would have a disagreement. And so we would all go away and design games to prove our points. Yeah. And by this, we mean like Vincent and Emily and Joshua A.C. Newman and Ron, like Edwards. Ron Edwards and Clinton R. Nixon and Luke yeah. Crane and like <laughs> a whole bunch of people. Me. Uh, yeah. Um, Matt Wilson. Oh, what's her name? Alan. Her last name is Alan. He's with a J. Oh, no. Who? Shoot. 
I, it's not going to come to me. She's from the Forge of old. Anyway, yeah. whatever. Yeah. And so, like... What was the way that you proved your point then? What, what, when you look back and say, you know, I was right and, and I proved it this way, what, did you, what mechanically did you make to prove your point? Do you remember? Well, that's an interesting question. Um, n- not that point. No, I don't remember. <laughs> you can ask Emily. She may remember. She may. No, I just yelled that one a lot. Yeah. Well, and, and I'm, you know, one of the things that I wanted to do in this conversation before we get into the birth of Apocalypse World is I wanted to try to get an understanding of the seeds of yeah. a lot of things. Oh, and yeah. I'm already seeing them, right? You know, I, I, like one of the things, one of the things that took me when I read Apocalypse World was how prescriptive you were about how a game should be played, which um, is not something that I had seen before. Um, and I, I don't know. Um, I mean, now it's, it's, it's a lot more common now, but, but, you know, at the time it wasn't. So this, this helps me a lot to help kind of understand that. I have, I have a couple. Um, I want to talk about that point. Okay. But I want to, I okay. want to you go fill in some historical okay, stuff, which please. was, uh, that was pretty common at the forge before apocalypse. Or, um, quite common at the forge. You know what I would say now, we never quite said it this way at the forge, but what I would say now is that we always took it as our, as our responsibility to meet the needs of the people who decided to play our games the way they were written yeah. rather than the needs of the people who decided not to play our games as they were written. And so right. we always, that the, the people who would, who would follow the rules were, were always our first audience. And so writing the rules to be followed came from that. Um, that makes sense. So you weren't writing it for the other bakers out there who never followed the rules. <laughs> <laughs> by, by then, like as soon as you play a game that you can follow the rules and it's great. Yeah. It cha- changed my mind about how role playing games could and should work. Um, I want to talk just for a minute before we move into sort of apocalypse world where Mo- where the majority of my game design yeah, yeah. was happening at this time. Please. So um, really it's two different places. One is um, I'm a certified sex ed teacher for um, 7th to 12th grade. And I wasn't teaching at the time, but going through that process and understanding the use of games to communicate things of meaning um, to an audience that needed to hear them and engage with them in creative ways that were not, here is a thing you need to know, but what do you think about this? Right. What do you think? Mm -hmm. Here is an idea, turn it around, try it on. How would you, what do you think? You know, and so designing games for those situations, playing that sort of games in that situation was definitely part of my game design background. And also from, 1996 through to, I guess, 2000 and, uh, I guess, 2010, um, I was facilitating a group, a a, a counseling group for parents dealing with serious postpartum depression, stress, and anxiety. And so that involved a lot of this sort of experiential I mean, you could you could definitely look at it as though it was a game. And like, sure, here's, a, sure. here's an experience we're going to go through that's going to take you a place and you're going to discover true things about yourself and you're going to come out the other side feeling buoyed up. Right. Um, and not in like a, like, oh, let's get through the week. It's like, we're going to show up and we're going to talk about how goddamn hard this is. Yeah. Because you don't have any other place where people are willing to listen to you without judgment, without um, giving you all the ideas like, oh, here's what you should do, but just listen, like, what's your truth right now? Yep. And those things really powerfully influence um, my game design, like our game design, what I bring to that. And, and it really hits into your point here about, which I feel like, and correct me if I'm wrong, but part of the point is um, clarity in writing and getting people right. to do what you need them to do. And how do you create this, 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 the space for the conversation that you want to take place? How do you drive toward that? Um, because you can't necessarily, this is not school. We are not here to grade you. We are not, we're not saying you must have this. We're like, here is the space we're making. 
and you're mm-hmm. welcome to come be in this space. And if you want to come be in this space, here are the guidelines and you know affordances yeah. and constraints and rules, and here's the dice we're going to use. And you're going to put the instructions on the box. Yeah, and we're going to put the instructions on the box. And, it's on the box. Yeah. And here's what we're offering. Here's what yeah. here's what the promise of this experience is. Yeah. Um, when so when you're having these conversations and battles, I would assume on the forge, right, with some of these ideas, um, what was what did you find? to be a convincer. So for those, those that were not believers at first that started to start to go, you know what, maybe Vincent isn't an idiot. Maybe he has a point here. What, what made some of them turn the corner a little bit? And I'm sure there were some that never, yeah. never, the never did. Sure, yeah. But it's always like, I'm show not, up you, with you the game. You say that, but I'm not sure there were any. <laughs> you, you, you show up with the game. The, the I, truth is in the play I of think, like, here's my point. Here's my idea about how the mechanics could work or how you could structure this here and maybe so, they'll do it so i say that we we won arguments that way but i who knows i think mostly i was just proving to myself that you know not necessarily that i was right but that it was workable that in fact i was onto right. something um you're showing your work uh well and and i'm i'm proving to myself that right. that you know and and then in my early 30s i was kind of strident and now my take is more that, uh, you know, the world contains multitudes. I don't know, whatever. Sure. I know, what you're <laughs> I know where you are. I'm older too. Um, I, I was considerably smarter at 30 as well. <laughs> right. I wish I could recapture that, that being right. No, um, yeah. <laughs> but that in fact, I, it was a door that I could open and go through, um, you yep. know, that, that looking, choosing to look at role playing games this way, even if I didn't convince a single one of my stupid friends, yep. um, I Nevertheless, guess. my my beloved stupid friends, um, <laughs> even if I like I could still open that door and go through it myself and I could there was still fruitful game design and yeah. game play uh, on the other side of that door. Well, and an amazing, I would imagine, a, a gallery of knives sharpening knives, right? Where, where you, you're challenging yourselves and each other and, 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 and taking it back and proving things to yourself. So I'm going to yeah. turn the question on you now, Vincent. What was a concept that you heard on the forge at first and were like, yeah, no, that 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 somebody made you let that maybe opened up your eyes to, to an idea or a concept that really at first you were reluctant to accept? Well, that is a really good question. And instead, I'm going to tell you about when I played D&D. Uh, OK. For the first time as an adult, I would say in 2008. Um, and um, my friend Lee ran that game. And it was the first time, and it was basic D and D Moldve, um, blue box, I guess, is Moldve. Yep. D and D, level one through three, and Lee sat down and quick drew up a dungeon that was an abandoned castle, a castle that had been taken over by goblins, and we went into this castle, and they Lee was playing to find out what would happen had set up a situation and did not know what was going to happen, didn't have an ending in mind, didn't have a plan, didn't know what we were going to do, and not only didn't know, but to do anything other than react naturalistically to what we did, to have the goblins do whatever the goblins would do, Mm -hmm. to do anything other than that would have been to put a thumb on the scale and would have ruined the game experience. Um, Interesting. That Mm -hmm. as the DM... Lee was there to have fun discovering what we were going to do. And that was, that was the whole point. Whole of, point. Um, and you can see Apocalypse Orb comes right out of that experience. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. And it, until then, until that experience, until that moment, I didn't understand what that was. I didn't understand what was happening in, in a it lot of me. games. Was Lee transparent? Was he saying, this is what we're going to do? Or did you figure this out? Oh, no, I, I figured it out. Yeah. Um, I mean, no, they, they, they might just not said, even have known. Yeah, themselves, they just but. said, "Hey, let's play D anD D," and so we did. Um, but it Pretty was cool. it was not until and the the games that we were doing at the Forge were not really like that. As a as a GM in in most of those games, you had an editorial agenda that you were pursuing, mm-hmm. right? Um, and it was it was kind of an eye opener. Yeah. Um, 
Now, do you remember, and I'm sure it wasn't like on a eureka moment, I'm sure it was a gradual thing, but but do you have a sense of when you started as the player in that D&D game, started going, you know, something else is going on here. Like, this isn't this isn't what I was designing before. This isn't like anything I've done before. Like, something's different here. Like, when when do you think you got a sense of that? Or was it was it completely post-mortem? It was. It was completely post-mortem. It was, it yeah. was you know, an hour later or whatever. But um... when was... Oh, I don't want to derail this, but I just need a timeline question. When was the um, primetime adventures game with the moose? That was 2004, I want to say. Because I remember that also being a, a like. I don't know. If, I don't know if that was the same. It was. It was a completely was same, different. No, no. It was sort of same with this D&D unrelated. Game. That was that was more about you know. Um, so our friend Matt made this game primetime adventures. Yeah. This was in 2003 or 2004. I think it was 2003. Um, it must have been 2004. Okay. Um, and that was a game about uh, creating characters in conflict, um, in escalating conflict, in, in creating a game, intentionally creating a game with emotional stakes for the characters is what that was about. Um, and that was... I also didn't know how to do that before they showed me how to do that at the yeah. forge. Interesting. It, yeah. it was a really like I remember you talking about that game a lot, and it like the way that that influenced. I can see the way that that influenced some of your game design. Oh yeah, thinking, absolutely. In terms of um, having the rules of a game in Prime Time Adventures that allow you to set up the conversation and have the emotional stakes around we're playing a children's television game. Yeah, so, it's, it's, it so was, the emotional stakes, you know, the gift that that can be if you come from a background that has a lot of playing out, like, we have to own up to a, a lot of like teenage angstiness and like, yep. let's play violence, um, you know, our that have playing that playing that game. I I am really clearly like that. I would yeah. point to that as a place where you were like, oh, my God, we could do incredibly meaningful, poignant conversations and things that have escalating character drama and tension and gripping stuff where there's, you know, nobody getting killed. Yeah. Hmm. I, mean, I, I came from at that point, you know, pretty mission based shadow runny kind of, yeah. kind of play, um, you know, very GM driven with a plot twist at the, at the three quarter mark and stuff. Yeah. Right. Kind of play act one, act two. Yeah. yeah. Um, and this was this was um, this was a different thing. It's a really fantastic game. Yeah. I think that's an underplayed, under under known game, Un- underappreciated. Yeah. Prime Time Adventures by Matt Wilson. Check it out. <laughs> everybody, everybody listening right now is they've already got their flipped into the next page and writing down more stuff. We've dropped all kinds of fun stuff. Um, so, guys, we'll take a quick break. When we get back from this break, I think we've already set the table. So, let's talk about really when Apocalypse World started to form. So, we'll be right back. Right now is the part of many podcasts where someone comes on, interrupts the show, and explains that you should consider paying for the content you're already getting for free. They'll go on and explain that by giving a dollar or more a month, you not only support the show, but you allow the show to grow and improve. Here on the third floor, we commit to not interrupting your episode of Tabletop Talk with such a plea. We pledge not to run a spot asking you to go to patreon.com and give a dollar or more a month. Even if there's a link in this show's description, and there is, we won't ask you to click it and become a patron. We won't spend time yammering about the benefits like early access to episodes, getting those episodes without ad breaks, or even getting a chance to play in one of Craig's RPG sessions. Anyway, enjoy this episode we needed to clarify that we wouldn't do this type of solicitation. Hi, this is Brian. I started listening to Third Floor Wars for information and insight about my favorite miniatures game, Malifaux. But I also get great interviews with game writers, designers, and artists, as well as some fantastic role-playing sessions with some really great players. I've been supporting them on Patreon for a year and a half so far, and it has been well worth it. Time to give a quick shout out to some of our newest patrons. A big thank you goes out to Greg Packman, Eric Conrad, Joe Root, Alan Cardinal, Raven Shadow, Richard Beach, 
Philip Savoy, Patrick Allen, Third, Sean P. Kelly, Jesse Ravicki, James Kahn, and Rage Quitwire. Because of you and the other 100 plus patrons, we're able to put out content on a regular basis, and we appreciate it. So we've already kind of started talking about it a little bit, right? Where some of these concepts were started to form, um, where some of these arguments were won and lost and, and discoveries were made. Um, if I were a forensic scientist and uh, going through the archives of the bakers and trying to trace back the origins of, of apocalypse world, um, where do you think I would potentially go there? That's, that, that's where it, it, it was first born. Because it sounds like we're still kind of nebulous now, working on concepts and theory. Um, where was the first seed? Remember the day. But that's, um, that's specific. So, yeah. yeah. Uh, we came back from, I came back. You came back. From Gen Con 2008. Mm-hmm. And the going topic in our circles had been a game called 316 by our friend Gregor Hutton. Yeah. Um, that had polarized the forge and half of us loved it. And the other half couldn't understand how or why it was even playable despite the evidence of a bunch of us playing it. Um, and you know, their argument was you weren't playing 316. You were John Harper was running, you know, that was their argument. I mean, they have a bit of a point. No, they have no, it's not. <laughs> I just think John Harper is no. a good GM. John we'll Harper, move on from that. John Harper is great. Yeah. But uh, John Harper's on my side of this argument. I know. <laughs> he was a phenomenal guest, by the way. Um, oh, oh, yeah. yeah. Nice. yeah. I, I that miss that now. guy. I haven't seen him in years. Oh, you, you, you should listen to it. Uh, your, your, your name's come up. Um, and he just was, uh, and much like this interview, just so generous and and, and putting up with my, uh, with my questions. But we're not talking about Mr. Harper. We're talking about you guys. So um, the game is a polarizing game. Some people say it's not playable, but yet you're playing it. Yeah, yeah. Three, 316 was the name of that game. And um, I read it as soon as I got home. I, I played it once or twice at the con, and then I read it as soon as I got home. And I said, oh, is this what we're doing now? And um, I wrote the Brainer Playbook that day. No kidding. Um, uh, came straight out of my head. Born out of his head, and Canton's like Meg, this. I'm like, uh huh, that. Let's let's go from there. Yeah. Let's let's clear the schedule. For that. So if I were to go back then and look at 316 and read that, and then read that first version uh, of the playbook, what would I notice? What would I see as being this the 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 dump? Interesting. You you That's would cool. notice that neither Gregor nor I told any truths about what we were up to. <laughs> That's what you would notice. <laughs> that you are a bunch of liars. <laughs> we we leave the whole point of the game for you to maybe discover twenty sessions later. Interesting. Yeah, that seems, that's How, what, we're what does that mean? Um, I uh, don't want to spoil it. Okay. Honestly. So, three sixteen is a game about war, and it's about um, it's about space marines who who kill bugs. It's um, uh, what's the name of that? Starship Troopers. It's like it's about Starship Troopers, um, and it's about reaching the break point, rising in rank through the space marine military until you reach the reach the break point. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's uh, it's about a bomb and what you do or don't do with that bomb sooner or later. Um, but the bomb gets one sentence in the book. The the um, and like. You would never catch it. You would never like. I mean, of course you would. You would. You would notice what Gregor was up to, right? Um, you know, it's it's about how tolerable is it to live in a military empire. Mm -hmm. How tolerable is it to live in a military Mm -hmm. empire? Mm -hmm. Um, and are we talking about Vincent breaking 
the character or breaking the player? Yes. Okay. I think. I mean, when I played it, that was definitely the experience I had. It was like, oh, cool. Wow. I don't think there was a... Yeah. I mean, you... You know, years later, uh, when I read The Road, I was... I, I developed... I hatched a... a cranky theory, which is that when a post-apocalyptic writer like me or like Cormac McCarthy or like John Christopher mm -hmm. says, um, you know, in Cormac McCarthy's case, uh, people are having children to eat them. Um, he's not actually talking about what people would do if there were a nuclear war or whatever. He's actually talking in metaphor about yeah. what's happening in, in our, actual our world. Lives. Yeah, that's always been a great stage for that, right? And, you know, 316 is the same kind of thing, you know, it's, it's, and I, I think, I haven't read Starship Troopers, but I think Starship Troopers probably I don't. is too. Um, I very know, much that, is. That, um, you know, Gregor says you're space marines fighting bugs, but that's not, that's not what's actually going on in that. Yeah. In, in, that's not what it means. That's not. He, he when when he says this is what it's like to be a space marine fighting boats, he's like Cormac McCarthy saying, you know, stay away from the people who have children just to eat them. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's that's part of the whole piece. And oh, my gosh. It, you know, and when when I say, is there enough gasoline? Are there enough gasoline and enough bullets? I'm not actually talking about gasoline and bullets. You know? yeah. Um so when you look back at that moment then, Vincent, is it is it a situation where you found the setting and the and the mechanism to 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 make what you wanted to happen and play to happen? So you you found the world or was there some mechanics that you found there or was it both? I, I just I know you asked Vincent, but it's OK. If I of course. Yeah. What? Well, yeah. Yeah. I answered this question recently and it, as though um, the brainer showed up and said, here, I have a suitcase and some friends, but you're going to have to figure it out. I'm going to be over here picking my teeth with a toothpick made out of a sliver of a credit card. Um, because because it, it really did, it, at least from my experience, it really was like, here's the brainer, which implies so many things. And it really was like... Um, a play to find out for us as designers or um, you know, just follow each piece from the brainer outward to see what it implies. And that's where, I mean, that's where the game came from. Yeah. I mean, I wrote, I wrote the list of basic moves uh, on the, the playbook, you know, when you uh, act under fire, when you go aggro on someone, when you read, read a person. And I didn't know what those were. I just wrote them down. Yeah. Because I was listing the things that the brainer would do. And and I was listing the things that all the characters would do. And I called those basic moves for whatever reason. And then I listed the things that only the brainer would do. And I called those brainer moves, you know. The dice mechanic has an antecedent. Oh, yeah. No. And, like, if you if you start from there and go backwards into our design, mm -hmm. um, the... So we told you how... Cyrun works, where you roll a pool of dice, and then after you've rolled them, you assign them to the different components yep. of the outcome. Yeah. Um, that's what I wanted for Apocalypse World, but it was too much every time. And so, like, to design the moves, I clustered components of outcomes and just said, you get to choose two of them, you get to choose three of them. Um, and... You know, so it's it's an extremely direct derivative of, of um, the dice since I run. Uh, only it's 2d6 instead of a dice. Right. You know, it's, we, we had been working on a game immediately before Apocalypse World called Storming the Wizard's Storming. Tower. And in that game, you rolled a pool of dice and um, yeah. each four, five, or six counted as a hit. And it was like, for each hit, you get to ask one of these questions. Yeah. Um, and and we, so that comes, Apocalypse Work comes yep. straight at it. Yep. And we had an accessibility concern with Storming the Wizard's Tower because we were designing with middle school yes. students as a, a target audience. Um, and what dice can a poor what middle school kid get? Well, you can buy a pack of 
D6 um, at any drugstore in the country for a buck. Right. So let's use those. Interesting. Interesting. I, I had designed a game called Poisoned, which is about pirates. Um, that is not for middle schoolers. Not for middle schoolers. <laughs> Barely for anybody. <laughs> that, that's a heck of a game. Um, that, uh, but it has a, an early version of the basic yeah. moves as well. Um, you know, you can act under duress and go into danger. You know, this very this very verb oriented approach okay. to game design. Yeah, to do it, to do it, to do it. So I'm an interesting test case, and and to give you just a little background, and unfortunately the listeners have heard this several times, but it, it helps gives context to my my next line of questions. Um, so I, I was a bit of a Rumpelstiltskin when it comes to role playing games. Um, so I very played very heavy, um, you know, early, you know, seven, eight, nine, ten, all through high school into college, and then walked away. Um, and I took about a 20 year break from, from role-playing and, and, and it was, I did other nerdy stuff. Right. But, but for whatever reason, role-playing games just weren't a part of my life for 20, 25 years. And then I came back a year and a half ago. Um, and holy cow, so a, a lot had changed. Um, because when I walked away, it was, uh, you know, third edition D and D advanced D and D it was GURPS champions. Um, let's create a system that, that like the move was, we're going to create a system that you only have to learn one system and you can play whatever you want in it. And that was like the big thing. Right. I come back and I'm like, what, what the hell happened? Like, and, and, and I, you know, as I start exploring and figuring out things, like one of the things I come across is powered by the apocalypse, which I found, like many people found before I found apocalypse world, right? Um, and this concept of moves, and I'm going to tell you my first reaction was, well, that's a step backwards, right? Instead of you can do whatever you want to do, we're going to make you make moves. And not only that, like some of these games have GMs have moves they make. And I'm like, what the hell is going on right now? Like this is like this is the antithesis of what I thought role-playing was right now of course took one game and i'm like oh okay <laughs> but but oh in other games these are called subsystems right. I get it. Yeah, <laughs> exactly right but, but the first impression right the first impression is it was um it was it was so it, it smelled limiting and it smelled prescriptive right um when it when in actuality it's like the exact opposite of that right um but so what i'm the reason i'm giving you that is um I want to give you a sense of how revolutionary it was for me. Right. And so where does the, where, where does moves come from? Like, when did you guys go? Like, we're going to define this. And, and it's, there's almost a board game aspect to that in in a way too. Like, where does that happen? Uh, I mean, it happened when I wrote the brain. I I know that, but like, To try to answer your question, there's a a distillation there, I think, over the process of, you know, other kind dice, and which became Cyrun, and doing Storming the Wizard's Tower, and trying to sort of drill down to the heart of the matter, like, what am I doing, as opposed to um, the the open-endedness can be overwhelming. No question. You know? no question. And having something that provides, like, just do what are you doing, um, provided structure in a way that was useful, and we could see that happening. And then it was a question of identifying, um, as Vincent said, uh, okay, all of this sort of stuff is act under fire And all of this sort of stuff is read a situation E. Right. So those become the, the subsystems. Um, but the question really is in terms of where moves come from. And then you can see that through other games that we've designed since then that have moves, because not all of them do. The question is, what are you doing? Mm-hmm. And, and what are you trying to accomplish? Yeah. The, um, uh, I was being gamey on purpose. I wanted it to be like a board game. I wanted it to be, um, you know, when the GM turns and looks at you expectantly, you look down your character sheet and you choose your move and you do it. Um, and 
like I didn't want it to always play that way. Right. But when that happened, I wanted there to be something for you to say. Um, I mean, that you could you could simply choose a move and you could simply proceed. Yeah. Um, there's, there's and that they they would always they would always be things that you in fact meant to do and in fact wanted to do and you would be eager to do them and you were excited to wait, I can go aggro on this guy. I'm going to go aggro on this guy. So, but there's another piece in here, which is that between when you wrote um, Kill Puppies for Satan, uh, just after we had our second child, when um, Apocalypse War, when the Brainer showed up, we had just had our third child. So any game design that we needed to do or play testing that we needed to do had to fit around three children Interesting. And, a, and a full-time job oh, yeah. and a part-time job. Yeah. So that really shaped a lot of it. Like We did not have time to mess around with the like four hours before anybody does anything. Like I, like I remember playing games for 12 or 16 mm-hmm. hours in high school, and now it was like, cool, we can play nice. from 9 o'clock after the baby is asleep until 11.30, when the first other person in the play group starts to be like, I'm crashing and I have work tomorrow. So no. that was such a driving force on moves and on the GM specifically that like, I don't, I don't have time to do four days of prep work before the session. I, I just don't. Right. I need it to be something that I feel satisfied with my prep work in like, while the baby is sleeping, I have an hour and a half to put together where are the threat types? Where are they moving? What's an interesting triangle that's happening? And um, yeah, that's cool. I'm really cute. What? I wonder what the hell is up in the rafters? Yeah. You know, yeah. that sort of thing. And so that was a huge driving um, force in this. Um, get to the point. Do it. It was a paradigm shift for me, too, because I had left a world where the, all the weight was on the GM. And you were putting a show on for the players. And when I come back, it, it, it was, I was amazed at how it now became a shared experience and something that we do together. And, and, and the best way I've heard it put is suddenly the GM got to play, which, which sounds really silly, but for me was incredibly profound, incredibly profound running games now versus you know, running games, you know, 20 something, because I was a GM then and I'm GM now, but, but wow, I get to play now. And, and it's incredible. It's incredible. And it's interesting to see that that was on purpose. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, yeah. It was absolutely on purpose. Like even to the point of our design work on, on um, Apocalypse World, because there were places in that when our youngest was a baby that like the time we got to spend together being like, okay, let's work on this game design moment was so precious and brief. You know, and there'd be like, okay, I'm just going to make sure I always have a notebook with me so that I'm taking the little baby for a stroll around the neighborhood. And I'm like, oh, I've got to write that idea down, you know, because neither of us had cell phones. There wasn't text messaging yet, you know, yeah. <laughs> yeah. so there wasn't like walking down the phone. Line. So, so much of what we did in Apocalypse World is absolutely comes directly out of lived experience you know it has to be fun right now it has to be it has to be a payoff like i i can't wait i've waited all week to play this game with you please god let's just blow shit up let's make let's make stuff happen right yeah yeah no absolutely no question about that and and it and it, and it definitely works so what's the next stage in the development then so we we see the, you know the brainer gets put out there the brainer is t- telling you stories and helping oh, you yeah. design the game um when do you think what, what's phase two well we played the hell out of it um, i mean yeah like part of our design work is always to be like Here's a mechanic. Let's tr- test it. You know, there's, so there's a ton of little bits which you could look at as phase part of you know, the blur between phase one of like, what do you think about this? Yes, let's do that. Yeah. And phase two, which would be here's a PDF we could send off to somebody. So there's a ton of incremental steps of let's play this. Nope, that doesn't work. All right, I'll work on it later. To let's play for an hour and then we we started a playing lot. locally with our with our friends we started like playing 2007 no i mean that was 2008 that the brainer but as soon as we had six playbooks um, right right as right, soon right, as we right. had six playbooks we started playing it so and, 2009 um, so uh, so uh, maybe. the the brainer playbook was Gen Con 2008 immediately after 
and the book came out at Gen Con 2010. Wow. So those, okay. those two years. Yep. Um, as soon as we had, we had five or six playbooks, we were playing it locally. And then as soon as I had something to share, I was sharing it uh, on the forge. Mm-hmm. Um, this and was. What were some of the initial ago. reactions to that, Vincent, when you started putting it in front of people? <laughs> oh my God, my friends, I tell you. <laughs> um, so the. Uh, The the people who grabbed onto it were not my sort of debate partners at the Forge. Um, As close to that is John Harper. Um, He he was as close to an early adopter who was a debate partner at the Forge as as there was. It was um, mostly people who had not sort of committed to the Forge the way I had, but who picked the playtest documents up off of my blog or whatever. Well, I think um, part of it is who that really seized on it. Everybody was working on their own game. Yeah, you yeah, know, yeah. there was this right. cycle. Right. You know, before before widespread spread PDFs, before a good print on demand, before drive through RPG and Moo and things like that, there would be a real cycle of n- new for Jackon. So by right. the time you got around to January, like January and February, where we are was like playtest hell and we all felt it and we all played each other's games and we all commiserated because it would be like god i'm working on this game i know all right fine god Will you guys help me fix I my broken game and we're like crap. no that's so we're brutal. trying to fix ours <laughs> yeah but we it, it, it create and it's it's you know that's joshua and joshua ac newman and julia ellingbo and emily care boss and um Evan Torner and Kat Jones and us and um, who else am I forgetting? Elizabeth Sampat. Uh, Elizabeth Sampat. Um, and uh, that was pretty much the immediate crew during that time. Rumble. Rumble. Um, oh, um, Dev. Dev Patel. Dev Patel and Lars um, Sanders. Is that right? Sanders. 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 Yep. Um, all the sort of Massachusetts crew. We didn't get together with Deb and um, Laura nearly as often as we would have liked, yeah. but um, that meant that the indifference that Vincent mentions is because, like, it wasn't like whatever. It was like, God, I hear you, but I've got yeah. this thing. Yeah. Oh, oh no, they were like, whatever, Vincent, whatever. All right, I'm v- Vincent. Why are you sending us this nonsense? Oh, this yeah, is well, this inconceivable. <laughs> Like it's like in, uh, in what's the word? It's in unintelligible. Yeah, that's funny. So you you said that John Harper was an early adopter. So I, I'd be curious. Can you walk me through his reactions or his phases of acceptance? Oh yeah, like the like two days after he got the um, the playtest documents. So this would have been middle of two thousand nine. Um, he published a little game called Ghost Lines. I want to oh, say. Oh yeah, the trains one. Um, which was, you know, him internalizing Apocalypse. You know, he's he spent a day internalizing Apocalypse World and then published a little game out of it. Jerk. Know. <laughs> <laughs> no <I'm> kidding. Um, <laughs> so, like, I don't know what that process was like for him other than, you know, the way he tells it. I uh, Forgive me if I'm misrepresenting you, John Harper. The way he tells it, it's like, oh, oh, yeah. <laughs> So there's this thing that happens. I, there's a thing that happens when you're in, in textile work that is similar to this, where you're wrestling with it, like, how am I going to do that? How? Because it's textile work often, not always, but often involves thinking in three dimensions, um, mm-hmm. and that is hard. Um, you have to think about three dimensions, and you think, have to think about how do I unfold that shape. And in museum work, I run into it all the time where I have a distorted piece of, of a garment in some weird shape and I have to figure out how to care for it when I cannot possibly treat it like any other garment I would. So I have to think in a totally different way. And I'm like, sometimes that looks like looking at the garment and sometimes it look, it's like sitting and then it clicks. Mm-hmm. It's like, mm-hmm. oh, like that, you know? So... I think that this is a part, is part of game design, and I think it's why so many of us are also other. We have other creative outlets, and we have other ways in which we are system systems analysts and yep. system things problem leaders, solvers, problem solvers. Because that sort of um, 
of wide lateral connective thinking gets us to these leaps that allow for the brainer to come, boom, and then we go, or for Tom Harper to be like, oh yeah, you know, it, it just, it happens. The reverse is also true. The part where you're like bleeding out of your forehead because if you're hitting the table with your head so much, like I have, I can't, I don't want to get, to, uh. it's also, that's also true. It's not like any of it is easy, but I think that it's, um, it's part of the picture though, in, in games that are yeah. Now the concept of partial successes, um, was that something that we can look to apocalypse world for, or did that exist before? And you kind of brought it in. Oh yeah. No, I think I learned it from Talos Lanta. Got it. Uh, yeah. conceivably back in 89. Um, like even shadow run, you know, where you're rolling a dive pool and you're counting the, yeah. counting the successes. Um, and like, Shadowrun does a, a pass fail on some tasks, you know, if I need to pick the lock, I need three successes or whatever. Yeah. But when you're fighting, each success just becomes a, a hit point damage or whatever. Like, I don't remember Shadowrun. But, um, and really the, those, those partial successes come from that idea of, you know, but it wasn't codified there though, Vincent. I, I mean, I understand what you're saying, but like the, the concept of, and, and this is this is my lack of understanding of the history and the lineage, right? But that, here's how it struck me. I was I was amazed because I came from a pass fail world, and I came back to a world of wow, like you know, a failing forward, uh, succeeding with consequences, and and it's not just you need a sixteen, um, and and so that blew my mind, and. I'm trying to, I've, I've been trying through all of these conversations to try to understand when it got codified. When did it say you succeed with consequences? I, I have an insight. I'd love to hear if you have a, yeah, point, no, but I, my insight I is that this that pulls back hours. in, yeah, but I think it comes back into something we touched on earlier, which is gamers having kits and that educate education theory mm-hmm. proceeds with mm-hmm. kids and it, in education theory, one of the things you come to is that idea that uh, suddenly, finally, we can embrace failing forward. You know, as as the importance of STEM uh, curricula comes up, and we recognize that, oh God, yes, fail all the time, fail forward, fail, fail with joy. Um, that influences all of the people who are doing game design, and I definitely think that for me, with you know, a mixed success piece, um, part of that comes from the big night. Um, Alan, what's Alan's last name? Do you know? oh. Anyway, the big night, um, which is a game designed to be kids or play, play kids sort of things. It's very cool. But the, the idea that failing isn't, the, it doesn't mean the, the game stops. It doesn't mean you, you're bad. It doesn't mean you failed. It doesn't mean it, horrible things happen. It means, oh God, you missed that roll. The shot went totally like bad. Where did it go? Right. And then you're like, oh, I want to tell you. I get to tell you. You know, because that's so dang cool. That was that was a thing. Um, this this very particular little thing. Um, in the forge in like 2001, 2002, 2003, which is, which is when that yeah. game came from. Um, and I think it. It may have appeared originally in Ron Edwards' game Troll Babe, and it may have mm-hmm. appeared somewhere else first. But the idea was that the GM describes your successes and you describe your failures. Yeah. And, um, you know, that moment of empowerment at the moment when you were disempowered. Right. Um, uh, it's freaking great. It's, it's, <laughs> it changes the, changes the game. Like yeah. It's, yeah. A, it's a real... Yeah. A real upender of, of how that works. But, um, you know, with the, the, I, for whatever random reason in my head in the late nineties, I became really probably because I love Yahtzee. I became really intent on the idea that you would make decisions about the dice after you had rolled them. Mm. Um, and so, you know, with, with other kind of side run where 
you never roll all sixes. I mean, once in a while you do, and yeah, you're, right. you're as happy as can be. But usually you have a high die and a low die that you have to decide where they go. And, um, you know, breaking breaking the your efforts out into this set of consequences, possible consequences, instead of a single outcome, um, and then letting you choose between them, that was a really important part of those of those partial mm-hmm. successes. Uh, you know, and that's why in Apocalypse World, they're all choose, on a, on a 10 plus, choose two, on a 7 to 9, choose, right. choose one, is because that's equivalent to rolling two sixes and a, and a three, or a six and two threes, you know. In, um, so the phrase that um, amazes me, um, and I'm in love with it, is uh, tell me what happens. Right. And, and it's, it's a very simple, simple phrase that when I and my first exposure to it was uh, Jay Little's narrative dice. Um, when I came across that and realized what, what Little was talking about with the dice and because I picked up the Star Wars because I love Star Wars. And and I was like, oh, this is, you know, fantasy flight. You got to buy their dice. Right. And I thought it was a gimmick. And then I started using it. And I'm like, holy crap, this is amazing. But that was my first exposure to. Uh, and it wasn't the first time it happened. My first exposure to tell me what happened. Um, it, that sounds to me like it was happening with you guys for a long time, that, that you were doing that way before Apocalypse World, where you were, where, where you were saying, we're all going to do this together. Yep. Yeah. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, absolutely. Definitely. Like there were like pivotal moments um, of playing Ars Magica with Esther in college and absolutely with playing Emily, uh, playing Ar- Ars Magica with Emily for years afterward. And, all the way through, and then at the like, forge, and at the forge, and you know when we got together locally with different, yeah. you know, yeah, 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 no. Um, and was that a conventional wisdom then at the forge at that point? Was everybody saying, "Yeah, you, we're all going to do this together now," or was well, that the, the, one of the things at the forge was narration rights? Yeah, and so there was this game called the Pool. Uh, no, this is this is good stuff. This is important. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> the, um, there's this game called The Pool that our friend James West made, James V. West, um, which, how did the pool work? There was some sort of, you would roll your dice and then you would, under some circumstances, you could choose whether you would succeed and the GM would say what happened or you would fail and then you would say what happened. Mm-hmm. And that that took off. That right. caught on and a lot of people incorporated, incorporated. That that must be where it came from before Trollbabe. Where like oh, Trollbabe yeah. codified yeah, that to on a on a failure you describe what happens and on a success the GM describes yeah. what happens. Um but uh that was a an incredibly influential game in 2000, 2001, 2002, something like that. And um, there were there were a million games that had different takes on that, different angles on that, different nuances of that. Um, under what circumstances you got to say what happened and under what circumstances somebody else got to say what happened. At, at what point did the two of you decide that the GM uh, or the CM was not going to roll dice? At what point did you say, you know what? The players are going to roll dice. That worked. First time I wrote a move. Like yeah, I wrote, like, I wrote the, thing, the brainer playbook, and sooner or later I had to commit to what acting under fire meant. Yeah, but um, that's that's still different than that the, the MC doesn't roll dice in Apocalypse World. That that was never a principled decision for me. That is just <laughs> how it happens just, to happen. Yeah. And but that's important. Like it's huge. One of, yeah, one of the things that um about uh, some of our game design, people are like, wow, this like but it's just how it went. I, we didn't choose it. Yeah. A lot, there yeah. are things that we spent a ton of time and energy really carefully thinking about. But that just, you know, by the time we followed all the threads out from the Brainer playbook and got to like, okay, that's a rule set that people can play with that does what we want to do and creates this container around the conversation in a way that feels good and works. Oh, GM doesn't roll dice. All right, I guess that's fine. You know? It was, it was like literally 50-50 whatever came out of my head that day, whether it was all the player rolling or every roll would be an opposed roll with the GM. Right, right. And, and what, what it does, or what it did for me, I should say, not what it does, what it did for me was suddenly like I'm like, I don't have to be behind a screen anymore. 
right? I, I don't have to hide, hide and circle my little, you know, D4 and then, you know, do that. And, and, and that blew my mind as well. Um, and I don't know whether, uh, so here's the question. Was there a desire to add transparency as part of this collaborative process where we're not, we're going to just, everything's going to happen in the open. We're just going to roll dice together. We're going to figure out what happened. You're going to have narrative rights to, to this process. Was that just the, like how it all ended up happening? Cause you wanted that to be the case. Yeah. yeah. That's what we were all doing. Yeah. Well, yeah. And, and in like in our own design, I had written um, a thousand one nights specifically to defetishize dice in that's one of my like I think I even lay it out in the game text in the end of the book you know that the point is that like just use all the pretty ones put them in the middle of the pile they're the gems of the sultan go from there and so we had that piece going into um, storming the wizard's power and, and apocalypse yeah. world of like there is no reason for to put there's no reason why would you do that to put one person in your group in that place of pressure and power and like freak out stress and by that time of course all of us did have the internet and ways to connect and find each other and all of the stories about how crappy that was for some of us as kids growing up mm -hmm. and like mm -hmm. what that led to in terms of of just not cool stuff and why would we want to replicate that um, so making different choices. Yeah. But, um, but the idea that everybody would know the rules, everybody would be able to read the dice. There was no reason to keep the dice secret. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, that's, that's part of, if the game works, you don't need to fudge dice and everybody can read them. You can just roll your dice and we can all, we can all see what's going to happen and we can all. Yeah, we can all read them correctly and follow the rules. Well, and we correctly. also we also put and that in, was that was part of the forge's ethic. Yeah, yeah, and then specifically in the apocalypse world, we also put in a piece of like do overs is cool. Like if you're like, oh, hold on, that no, I forgot a thing. Let's redo that bit, and sometimes okay. that involves a you know re-roll. Yeah, being like, yeah. oh, hold on, no, you actually made that roll because I we we, we yeah. messed up with it. So. Putting that part in the transparency column as well, saying, you know, there, there's no, there, nothing, nothing should make a piece of plastic ruin someone's night. <laughs> yeah. We, we are playing, right? It's, it's, it's crap. Don't yeah. do that. And an MC, like a, a GM. <laughs> well, like, Consent is fine. If you're like there to like destroy my character. Okay, cool. I'm all for it. Yeah, for no, it. I was, I was going to say something. Okay, cool. But I want to say one other piece, which I've been saying a lot lately, which is the, an, a GM who says, Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. That's how the, that's just how the dice were. You're, I'm sorry. And there's nothing I can do has come to be for me. If there isn't really good buy-in and really level playing field in terms of the actual real life power at the table, that is as crappy to me as a player who says, well, that's, that's just what my character would do and uses that as an excuse to be cruel or um, belittling or bullying or, yeah, just don't, just, just don't. You don't have to be that way. So if that means occasionally going, oh, I see that this means more to you. How can, can someone help? You know, the helping rules, helping mechanics, like, oh, Somebody help this person. <laughs> no, right. Do that. Life's too short. Uh, I was going to say that uh, some games use hidden information like Scrabble. Oh, and yeah. Some games use exposed information like Yahtzee. And um, they're both good. You should choose the one that you need for your game. So the other thing, and there's, I mean, we could have 10 interviews about this stuff. So I'm, I'm, I'm really oversimplifying stuff and you guys are being very patient with me. But the other thing that stood out to me was um, the, the codifying of relationships and making, putting a mechanic around relationships, the HX and just that, that entire piece, um, which, you know, a lot of the stuff I was like, yeah, I always did that. You know, I always had something like that. That was always an important part of my games, but it was never written down. Well, you guys wrote it down, right? And you and you and you put a mechanic around that. What what drove that for you? Um, that I think was from for me. It is definitely dealing with the sex ed background 
and the um, counseling background that um, that how you are in the world ties to other people and that your constant that your actions in the in the world how you treat other people has repercussions and that if you're interested in playing a full human being if you're interested in playing a full character they're going to have these other other entanglements you know it's they're it's just true and um that's really where that comes from for me and hx comes from um it's uh, medical shorthand for history i was an emt and um it sure does look apocalyptic. <laughs> it does. It does. But but what what so I, I get that for a style of play, right? So you, you were and, and you know there were games that were being played before Apocalypse World where this was a central piece to the play in those play groups, right? In in those sessions with those with that particular group of players. What makes you say no? We're going to. This is going to be written down. It's going to be dictated, not dictated, but it's going to be outlined clearly in the book, and and we're going to we're going to mechanically make it present. I, I'm trying to figure out where 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 the decision to put it down on paper comes from. Because it's an inherent. I'm going to say this first. You can next. Um, because it's in, an inherently feminist consent driven piece of work. Got it. And that. To, to put that on the table um, gives some bit of place to stand on from my perspective as a designer to say that you have agency in this area. Because I, like I said at the very beginning, extremely un, unlikely, you know, that my first GM was a girl a couple years older than me and that I have always played, I don't, in in mixed groups, right, and the the consistent narrative that we ran into forever and still run into of people who have been like just really traumatized at a gaming table over how, their actual being. Um, I I want no part of that, and so yeah. putting it putting it explicitly in there. I am fine if you never engage with them, but it needs to be on the table. It is important to me that Apocalypse World has been a place where people that I know have been like, "Oh, hold on, maybe it's okay if I'm queer." What would it be like? Would that be okay? Yeah. And I mean, that's part of what role playing game has always done. Mm -hmm. But, you know, putting it in the book of like, what if, you know? So that's, that's my piece. Sure. In, in why the history move, the, for, for why history is the way it is and why the sex moves are in the book. Um, and like, what if I was writing it in 2021, if we were about to come in, out, out with it now, I might shift a little call it an intimacy move and switch things around but Vincent wouldn't <laughs> I think a, a lot of the games that came after Apocalypse World called them intimacy moves and some of them make no sense but see that's it's like the thing it's like when you're having coffee with your brother no that is not that is not, not a real move that so is I, not I got, we've got a whole segment for this so let's hold off on that because I do want to talk about I do want to talk about the fertile ground that you guys put out there but um, but uh, Vincent I want to know what, what's your angle on this uh, talk to me about you codifying this so um the the way history works in particular helping and interfering based on this this stacking up with the other person that comes right out of a game called the mountain witch by tim kleiner okay. um and you know in in his game it's how much you trust each other you're a bunch of ronin uh, climbing mount fuji to kill the mountain witch and you can't trust each other but you must trust each other and so that's that's that mechanic and um from that seed, it, it developed into what it is in Apocalypse World, but that comes right out of right out of Tim's game. That's it's very very cool, and um, I have yet 
I, I think I've played everything at this point, but Apocalypse World. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you should that. Mike. You, have great mic. you obviously have a time slot that works. <laughs> Why are you talking to us at, on a Tuesday night? You could be playing Apocalypse World. <laughs> That's funny. I mean, you could be talking to us kind of, kind and playing Apocalypse World. <laughs> um, but it... Um, and, and it was part of the reason that I hunted you both down is because, you're, quite frankly, your names kept coming up as I kept talking to different people in the industry and started basically catching up. Um, and I'm doing it through my podcast um, and learning it. Um, I, it helped me forensically find like, oh, I, here's where it kind of here it is a little bit. And we've done a really good job, I think, of, of helping me and hopefully the listeners kind of understand how we got there. Um, and what I want to do is I want to take a break. When we get back from this break, we're going to talk about what happened after. Afterwards, because a lot has happened since. So we'll be right back. Howdy, friends. Craig here. Nothing makes Malifaux easier than having the right tools. Here at the third floor, we love all the licensed Malifaux goodies from Custom Meeple. Not only are they helping support this podcast, they sell custom made weird licensed tokens and terrain. They sell it all. Crew boxes, terrain, markers, tokens, and even a 3x3 full Malifaux board. Custom Meeple sells a complete M3E token set covering every marker and token you need to play. Custom Meeple are the source for the official accessories for Malifaux. Everything is designed by hand and authorized by Weird Games. Check them out at custommeeple.com, that's with one M, or follow the link in the show notes. Up your Malifaux game and be sure to tell them Craig from the third floor sent you. If you use the promo code third floor friend, all one word, T H I R D F L O O R F R I E N D, you'll get a 5% discount and help support the podcast. It's valid on everything except retail products and play mats. I, I mentioned, uh, uh, to Miguel and Vincent that uh, that I, I'd heard the term powered by the apocalypse before I'd heard uh, of apocalypse world. Right. Um, and um, I've had a great opportunity to talk to a lot of people um, from designers to people that are lifelong players. And um, one of the, one of the ideas I want to hammer out with you guys a little bit is um, this concept that I'm coming across and people are very opinionated about this, which is when we're playing a role-playing game, are we, creating a world and we have some people in it and I'm using people generically players in it. Right. Or are, is this a story about the players? Are they the central characters to what's happening here? So let's, let's go backwards just for a second to apocalypse world. If, if I were to force you to say it's one or the other, could we say apocalypse world is one or the other, or is it whatever the hell you want? You could be both. No, no, no. I, I have such like my answer to this is, is concrete. Um, uh, Apocalypse World is a game about the actions that the characters take. Okay. And so to take actions, the characters must exist and they must exist in a context, but the game is about those actions. That's my answer. Yeah. No, that, I mean, that, that, that's the answer, right? Yeah. No, that, and that helps me a lot. So now, because I, I think um, when some people talk to me about Powered by the Apocalypse, that's what they talk about is how Powered by the Apocalypse really made the player characters the center of the world, right? And it's their story. Um, and I didn't know whether that was something that you thought as well uh, with Apocalypse World, or is that something that came from it? So that helps. So where does where do you start to realize? Um, you know, this core engine, um, and it's it's more than just a core engine, it's a philosophy and an approach. Hey, this, I love you so much. Oh my goodness. <laughs> this is this is this is something that we can't hold on to. Um, is it something where you said, yes, we want here, go, go with this, you know, run with it, or was it um like did people just start taking it? Like, where does powered by the like John Harper's way of understanding it was to design and publish a game. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And that was that was long before Apocalypse World came out. He'd seen the playtest material. A yeah. whole year before. Um, we uh by the time we published, um Tremulous was in in development. Progress. Monster um, Hearts, Monster, Monster, Hearts of the Monster of the Week, Dungeon World. Dungeon World. Those were the four. Those were the four. Plus a bunch that have not uh, existed since the regiment, I think, was right. Things that things that didn't actually come to fruition yeah. in in a in a way that 
some people would necessarily think of them. Like, people played the regiment, and John Harper might consider it, you know, whatever. Because, like, another part is not every single design has to be finished. Yeah. It's like, do what you do with oh, it and learn, yeah. learn with it. It's really important. And as when I'm working with younger designers, when I'm working with our kids even, that it's a good thing if you have 50 ideas to every product that you're able to, like, print out and lay on the table and say, here's a thing I did. Because, you know, yeah, have way more ab- abandoned 30 ideas before breakfast, you know, sort of thing. So we've we've already named some of the big ones, right? Dungeon World, uh, Monster Hearts, um, Blades in the Dark, I consider as part of that camp of, of really... Yeah, that came out later. Came out much, later. Like, yeah. much later, correct. Yes, correct. It, 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 that we were racing to publication. Interesting, like, interesting. We say that, but if you look we, at the... the, if you look at the, the like publication date, it, Apocalypse World came out first, and then Dungeon World and um, Monster Hearts and Monster of the Week, and Tremulous came out like a year, the year later, twenty eleven. So, but, go ahead. Um, but so basically, as soon as I said, "Hey, would you look at this playtest material?" You know, to my my friends and colleagues, they mm-hmm. were working on yeah. games. The the people who um, were the people who were like, "Oh, this." Yeah. There it was. And so by the time by the time we published, we knew what was coming. Um, and what was your reaction? So let's talk about Dungeon World. So you 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 get Dungeon World in front of you and you look at that. Um what's what what are your thoughts and reactions to it? Well, I sat down with Sage Latora in um 2011 before Dungeon World came out. Uh the preliminary their little red book um was was floating around. That they had not really gone into publication, and um, at that point, I could have, we could have, um, really concrete conversations with everybody who was working on it. We, yeah, there were like we a dozen were, of them. Um, we knew them. We talked to them. Yeah. Right. And so, you know these these were our friends who, who were like, "Can we build on your ideas?" And we said, "Obviously." Because that's how we had been for the last 20 years, is in this place of back and forth dialogue and communication yeah, yeah. between friends of like, oh, that, I think, I'm going to try this, you know, and that was just part of the process. The, um, you know, there's a whole chapter in the back of Apocalypse World that lists every game we ever played, or, or I mean, you know the one, um, and that was our, our ethic, and remains, our ethic is to... Yeah to yeah. build on each other's ideas. Um, and, and so our position, so, so it became really clear right away that, uh, that people were going to use the toolbox. Like, and that or like people wanted to. Yeah. Right. And so our choice then was to say yes or no. Yeah. And like, if we had wanted to be like, okay, sure, but you'll have to, pay us X thousand dollars amount of whatever, or we get a cut of everything forever, or, you know, figuring out all that sort of stuff. There's some factors in there, which one of them goes back to the design place, which were like three young children, (laughs) busy freaking life. And just, please just credit us and go do your thing. And, you know, but the other part of that is an, an actual ethic, which means back to, you know, the feminist consent, basis of it and like if this can help you right, you like, like uh, 10 years earlier I had felt completely shut out of producing yeah. role playing games yeah. and yeah. I wasn't but so so where we came down was on copyright and yeah. you know my interpretation our interpretation of copyright law is that if you want to publish our work you need our permission mm-hmm. we can license it to you or whatever but if you're publishing your own work that's your work. That's your work. And if it's based on our ideas, every game is based on every right. ideas. Like, right. there's no, there's no... Give credit where due. Right. So, so our ethic is, is, you know, credit your sources. Credit us when we're your source. Yep. Same as we credit our sources. I mean, you've heard us through this. Like, we can't go a minute without naming something or buddy, you know. Um, but you don't even need our permission if you're not using our words. Yeah. Right. Uh, and... Like I have these ideological opinions about game licenses that where I'm like, 
you know, if I if I agree to the license, I'm actually giving up rights as a creator. Um, you aren't extending rights to me. I'm extending rights to you. Yeah. Uh, and you know, if if I want to make a game, you know, an OGL game or whatever, uh, I would be better off not adopting the license. And do it. Anyway, <laughs> whatever. The, I have my my cranky. I, I know where you're headed. headed. Yeah. 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 Um, and so I couldn't I couldn't see personally any place to stand other than copyright law. Why Why would I try to like and. I dislike copyright law for many reasons, but at least we can agree to it. At least yeah. that's what we know, right? Yep. And at least at least if I say no, just follow copyright law. You need our permission to publish our work and you don't need our permission to publish your work. Um, then then we can be satisfied that that is in fact how we're conducting our society right now and uh, that, that nobody is taking anybody in that situation. So did you, did you have a reaction uh, to Kobolds and Sage's work? So when you read Dungeon World, did you just see it as a reskin, or did they really take it to uh, uh, interesting places in your mind? I'm going to fess up. I don't think I've read Dungeon World. Well, that solves that problem then. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I sat down and I had this long talk with Sage about, about what they were doing and yeah. what their dreams and aspirations were, where they were going, and how our visions for the future of gaming lined up. And uh, I was completely satisfied with what, with what they were doing, what their, um, you know, who, who they were saying, fuck you too. <laughs> That's great. Um, and I can't, I've got actually, I'm excited because excited I have Sage booked for the show. Uh, so I can't wait okay. to talk to him. I've heard he read a dungeon world. So I'll ask him that question. <laughs> <laughs> Um, well, so out of curiosity, then, um, you know, we look at Monster of the Week, we look at Monster Hearts. I mean, do you look to any of those and see them as a next generation? Or do you see them uh, as just part of the overall ecosystem? Yeah, I definitely see it as a, like an ecosystem attitude. Um, and like, that pond can be really big. You know, I think I have a lot of different stuff going on down there. Um but I think in order to get to sort of next generation PBTA design, it has to go further afield. Okay. I mean, we've talked about that a little bit. Like our PBTA eye openers, you know, in order to get to next generation, from my perspective, uh, it has to be like, how are you changing this in a, in a, in a, it, it can't just be different. What? You're looking at you know, me. I don't know if I didn't say it that way. Oh, okay. I mean, that's fine. I think the ideas are going to diffuse into the into the atmosphere. Yeah. Right. And that, um, you know, X many years from now, you won't be able to tell what came from where. Like, n- none of those, none of those distinct... Very fair. Yeah. Things are going yeah, to survive. Yeah. And I think um, that there's... That's, that, I think that's more accurate. Yeah. The, the next generation implies a lineage in a way that is um, more uh, clearly delineated yeah. than I think it is. I think that as, as there become more and more and more PBTA games, it becomes more diffuse. It becomes more like, you know, just more weird. Well, and, and, things. and as those ideas have influence outside yeah. of PBTA, yeah. right? Um, you know, as far as I know, Quest, for instance, is... As far as I know, they aren't directly influenced by uh, Apocalypse World or PBTA in any mm-hmm. way, but they've encountered those ideas yeah. somehow, and and they have arrived at some conclusions the same way we all have, and so those those boundaries blur in both directions. Yeah, definitely. So there's a lot of people that have talked to me about Monster Hearts, and they see that as a shift, right? As 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 um what was important and the focus for many people, they see Monster Hearts doing something a little bit different. Um, and I'd be curious to know whether you think that that's the case or not, or was, Mo- was Monster Hearts uh, putting even more importance on uh, the intimacy moves, uh, the the relationships and things like that. Is that just a natural part of Apocalypse World, just put in somewhere else? Or or was it was that something different? I think you'd have, you'd have to ask Avery, but I think that... Right. You can definitely. And I will. <laughs> oh, good. But I think that I think that there's. I think that that's not a, a. I think that's an observation that could be made that there are different games out there that are PBTA that took something from Apocalypse World 
and followed that further out. Like, what, right. what, you know, great. Uh, yeah. You know, one of one of my very favorites is our friend Epidiah Rauschow's game Wolf Spell. Mm-hmm. Um, and what that game does, and it has, you know, it has a thousand influences, same as every other game. It's not, it's not derived whole from a box world. But what it does is it takes um, reading a situation and it says, here's how you read a situation when you're a wolf. And here's how you read a situation when you're a Viking warrior. And it creates this really interesting game about you're a Viking warrior who's been turned into a wolf. Are you going to stay a wolf or are you going to, are you going to turn back at the end? How do you deal with the world in both of those ways? And it, so it sort of takes this, this little piece of apocalypse, world, this little piece of apocalypse world, and builds it into a, a game. And I see that happening a lot. Um, you know, and, and Monster Hearts does that as well, where, you yep. know, there's this piece that then, that then, yeah, and, I think and, I, and I'm, I'm making sort of a blooming gesture, but it doesn't come from Apocalypse World. It comes from everything else and coalesces, and Apocalypse World is one of those threads. It's one of the threads in, woven in there. Yeah, that makes a ton of sense. That makes a ton of sense. And maybe it's maybe it's too easy just to say, well, we see this sim- we see the mechanics, right? And, and yeah. say that that's that that, that that's what, what what drives it. But I mean, you guys have made a very strong case in the in the last two hours of saying no, that, that's just a that's one thread in all of this, that it's a much bigger thing. And it and it's it's yeah, that makes a ton of sense to me, a ton of sense to me. Um so I had this conversation <laughs> with my friend Bill White. The, the going topic of that year, whatever, at the conventions was um, that if you made a PBTA game, Vincent did the game design work. That Ooh. was the, like, the going I, conversation. Yeah. Um, and so Bill, who's a, a game historian, um, he put it to me. He said, Vincent, if I make a PBTA game, did you do the design work? And I'm like, Bill, say I come to you and I say, Bill, I need you to make a car chase mechanic. And it has to work with 2d6, and you can do 2d6 plus a stat. You can do another resource if you want. Has to fit on uh, eight and a half by eleven. Two one side of eight and a half by eleven, and it has to fit in these structures called moves. And you go away, and you come back, and you say, "Vincent, I did it. Have I done the design?" No, no. I just posed you this ridiculous I like, challenge. I was like, like "Here are some, <laughs> here are the tools. Here's the right. constraints and affordances. Yay, go!" <laughs> you know, yeah. Anyway. Well, it's a great way to great way to articulate it, though, because I can understand where the other argument comes from, um, but I think that that quite honestly shuts it down, right? Um, it makes it very, very clear. And if there's one person to answer the question, or two people to answer the question, it's the two of you. <laughs> Speaking of questions, you did mention that it's been two hours, and I want to make sure that we get to your questions. So, if there are other questions, because as as uh, we really enjoyed talking with you and Thank we can you. clearly do it for a long time but if you have other questions you're like i really want to not miss the chance to ask this let's yeah. make sure we hit that i have one more left and then you guys are free of me <laughs> <laughs> i'd be interested now um what are you what non-baker games are you excited about what non-baker games are you playing and what are things that make you excited about tomorrow and five years from now from a game oh. perspective I love all those questions. Um, Non-Baker games. Okay. (laughs) Okay. So um, are you familiar with the internet phenomenon known as baseball? I am not. Well, I am. (laughs) Blazeball is a surrealist um, fantasy baseball phenomenon online that is bizarre and fun and strange. And the Discord that I help moderate has like 31,000 people. Whoa! Yeah. So, in terms of non Baker games, the game band um, who created Placeball, we're kind of playing that a lot in a really weird, like, I guess I want to go manage people's drama on the internet. <laughs> it's lots of fun. Um, Can you give me a little idea of what it is? Oh, sure. It's like, it's fantasy baseball with cross with Night Vale. Interesting. Yeah. With a little like weird, you know, like, Some, weird there are spins. Fictional it's, teams. Yeah. You follow a fictional team. Um, like, I have no idea how it started, but it looks to me like it started as a randomized baseball scoring yeah. 
simulation. Isn't that fascinating? Of baseball really games. cool. If you've ever scored a baseball game with pen and paper, and I stuff, have. Yeah, yeah. Kind of intensive, and it started with that. And um, I don't know that it started with that, but that's at the heart. That's of what it smells like. Right? If you're interested, and like in, go to go to baseball.com. Yeah. If you've scored baseball games, you will be as hooked as as I was. <laughs> interesting. I was, I, I was announcing the games into, the, so cool. into the living room to whoever would listen. <laughs> and I was like, okay, gotta check this out. Oh, I can be like part of it. So I'm doing that. So are you just... scoring fictional people or are you yes. scoring? Yes. It's, okay. We can talk they about just this scroll, later. Just, they just scroll past these let's, fictional let's, games. Let's not get and you follow your right. team and you hope you win and you get points. And like, I've, I've, the, I've, the, got, the, I've got homework. Yeah, it? I like the, it. The Hellmouth. The Hellmouth. I'm a fan of the Hellmouth team. The Hellmouth. What's their Sunbeams. Hellmouth. The Hellmouth Hellmouth Sunbeams, Sunbeams, of course. Um, there's the Hades, the Hades Tigers are good. The, oh, come on, they're fine. No, the they're Chicago right, Fire right. Fire. The Chicago Firefighters. They are from Chicago. Um, <laughs> So uh, you guys, you guys are like super excited about this, which make which is really neat. And, and now I've got to go back to the Baker brain and go, what 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 hooked you? What, like, what is it about this that makes you go, this is really cool? It is surrealist fun with a with an extremely queer element and extremely horror element, um, and it creates community around it in a way that is really interesting. And it came up during the first six months of the 2020 pandemic when people were largely isolated. So it gave people a way to connect and it introduced people who liked baseball but couldn't go to baseball games um, with a, a way to deal with that. And people who liked like weird imaginary fandom, a way to deal with that. And now you're getting this amazing mash intersection that I get to see up close and personal of people who are, you know, 65-year-old ex-baseball players really going, I don't know what this is, but I guess these are my pronouns and you're all cool. <laughs> Which Isn't is, that something? It's really neat. Yeah. Um, so that's one game. Um, you specified non-Baker games, though, and that's hard. I'm a big fan of Treehouse Dreams, um, which is uh, Drew Henderson. Um, what other games have we been playing? Oh, we just, we, we're, we're playing, um, the Space Junk game. Oh, Daniel Solis's, Daniel uh, Solis's board, junk new board game. Is the name of it. Yeah, let's say that in a way that isn't super cute. Daniel Solis's game, Junk Orbit. Okay. Junk it, Orbit, okay. It's a, it's a tabletop. Board game. Like a, you make the board out of cards and move your pieces it's around on it. It's really game. fun. It's really fun. It's cool. We're playing Emily's game in development. That is about spies. Oh my god, our friend Emily. She is making a game. It's called The World's Problems. It's based on the BBC show The Sandbaggers. I don't know if you ever watched The Sandbaggers. Mm -hmm. It is straight up Cold War um, British spies. Spy drama. Oh, that's cool. And it's uh, it's real fun. It has, it's it, um, you know, it's Tinker Taylor's on the spies. John Lacari. Very cool. It has yeah. its hooks right in my heart oh, and yeah. guts. Yeah. I love that game. And and Elliot's too. Very, very cool. So, so what's next? Um, so what do, can people that are going to get more uh, from you guys, is there anything um, on the horizon? Yeah. We just finished the text for Under Hollow Hills, um, which is the game that we've been working on for a while, in which you play members of a traveling fairy circus performing nice. in the mortal world and in the fairy realms. Um, and I am really excited about it. And we just finished it. We just finished the text to, to book design next. Yeah. Which is very cool. cool. Um, yeah. We did a Kickstarter for it a couple of years ago and now it's going to finally come up. Yeah. I mean, the pandemic threw a, a year long wrench, you know, 2020, which is like, <laughs> So in our defense, we are not yet a year behind, yeah. not yet a year late. Not yet. <laughs> not yet. I mean, time works differently in fairyland. I know it. <laughs> um, so there's that. Uh, Elliot is our, our middle child. Elliot Baker has a Z, uh, zine quest zine out now um, for Burned Over, which is sort of what's next for Apocalypse World. Um, 
and uh, in a way. Yeah, it's it's the the two point five. Of yeah, apocalypse, of apocalypse world. world. Nice. Um, in so I'm gonna I'm way. gonna tell a little bit of the story of that. So um, uh, our kids. We have three kids. They're twenty. They're twenty four, almost twenty one, and fifteen. And so. um, when the older kids got old enough, they played Apocalypse World, and the younger kid <laughs> grew up hearing stories about their Apocalypse World campaign, and would come, you know, at, at twelve and thirteen, and say, "Can we play Apocalypse World?" And I'm like, "No, child, you can't play Apocalypse World. I'm sorry, that's not <laughs> that's not appropriate." Except for we were all like doing crazy things when we were. 10. <laughs> if you're going to play Apocalypse World, I can't know about it. That's, that's the rule. And you're 13, and you're my kid. <laughs> yeah. You got to go into Daddy's shoebox under his bed. <laughs> exactly. I want you learning that stuff in the streets. Um, oh, my God. <laughs> We've run out of shelf space for games again. I know. So, uh, so I said, well, wh- I mean, what would Apocalypse World look like for a more general audience, you know? And uh, people, like, Apocalypse Earth came out in 2010, in August, and by September of 2010, um, my friend Seth Ben Ezra wrote me and said, hey, can I have a PG-13 version of this? And I was like, no, actually, that's a really hard problem. Yeah. Because of yeah. how, how not just sex, but sexiness is, is built into that game. Yep. And the um, world had to change. Like, one of the things is that in in 2010, you know, we were halfway through Obama's first term um, in office, and like thing that we things were different. We were about to pra- uh, about to pass um, the Marriage Equality Act in Massachusetts. Uh, th- things were different, and so digging into that, like the post apocalyptic, was different then. The last little bit of time has <laughs> happened, and we're like, can we just get some hope punk in here where maybe we can, like, ah, and not blow up the Capitol? <laughs> right, thank you. Um, among other things, so um, and so burned yeah. over, burned over is that PG thirteen apocalypse world. Nice. That, uh, people have been asking for for ten years. You know? But I think it's important that it's not like a oh for kids. It's it's a different take. One of the ways right. that I look at it and I, that I talk about it is that. You know, apocalypse world is when the apocalypse has happened and there's tons, maybe lots of people left. Maybe everybody's left, but yep. you players are the ones who have a vision to make something of this. And Burned Over is a different thing. Like, the world is kind of on fire right now. What are you going to do? You know, it's not, it, it doesn't feel to me the same sort of like, dragging things out of the ashes and with burned over it feels to me like you're more on a, a pinnacle like you can still put the fire out there's there's still a chance yeah you know and it's a hopeful chance yeah it's like what if we find a way to thread the needle through this instead which i think is different that's it yeah that's great. I cannot thank the two of you enough. This was absolutely phenomenal. I feel um, I feel like I've caught up on 20 years of game development in, in just a short two hours, which makes me very happy and uh, far more informed for a lot of the interviews that I have coming. Um, for those out there that are listening that want to keep track of what's coming from you guys, that want to pick up Apocalypse World, what are the best ways for them to do that? Um, Lumpley.games uh, is pretty current. Follow us on Twitter. Follow the Patreon, um, the uh, lovely uh, Patreon yeah. is the way to... And that's, I think that's just patreon.com slash lovely mm-hmm. um, if you want to back me on Patreon. Yeah, and we'll have all of those stuff. We'll have like we all we all publish to that picture. Perfect. And what I'll do is I'll put all of that in the show notes, um, so the people listening can can quickly grab it. Um, and we'll have to come up with an excuse to steal some more time for me and have you come on again. Yeah, that'd be really cool. Anytime. And like you know, DM me and say so. May what is that with baseball? Baseball? What? Are you- what team should I do? I'm like, talk to me. I love talking to people. Oh, that's fantastic. And for those of you that stayed around to the end to listen, thanks a lot and take care. Hey, did you hear that? You leveled up. You finished another episode of Tabletop Talk from Third Floor Wars. If you want more from the third floor, follow us on Facebook and Twitter. Head on over to our YouTube channel. It is packed with painting tutorials, gaming tips, battle reports, and role-playing actual plays. Did you enjoy this episode? 
why don't you send a link to one of your friends so they can enjoy it too? Last but not least, write us a review on your podcatcher of choice. This helps us find listeners almost as cool as you. Yeah, without without question. So, uh, guys, the insider. Uh, try that again. Well, that was terrible, guys. We had a terrible time, and I spelled apocalypse. <laughs> I spelled I spelled apocalypse wrong. I just saw that. I'm sorry that we're going to give you so much editing work. Well, I, it's just I, I was I just trying to draw it out of you guys. You won't even talk to me. <laughs> this makes you don't know how happy I am right now. I love it when okay, good. when we, I have guests that just dive right in. And um, one of the things that I sometimes will catch guests doing is they they feel like they have to stick to the stick to the script, right? And I'm like no. that's that's my job. I'm the host. Yeah. You guys talk about whatever the hell you want to talk about. And when it gets dumb and boring, I'll bring it back. That's my job so i don't have to do I, that with you guys which makes me i happy. appreciate the gm ship there because it's also <laughs> like you're also doing the thing of like asking what you're interested in yep right yep. it's like oh that's interesting tell me about that bit yeah pulling your threads it. right yeah yeah, yeah 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 all right um so the idea for this next segment and we'll see what happens with it but i was trying to try to get a sense of before apocalypse world existed right um yeah. and w- what did you guys put out what did you make what did you you know what what was consumed by others and yep. then and then maybe look back on it a little bit that's my thought process here um let's see sure. where it goes yeah great hey are you still here look uh the podcast is over and you sat through all of the breaks and bloopers well i mean if you're here you might as well run over to patreon.com and become a supporter. Don't forget to rate and review this podcast too while you're at it on whatever platform you're listening to. I do appreciate you sticking around. Take care. <laughs>